and she has been visiting fellow with capsule for the last year and she has graciously uh, agreed to deliver the series of lectures on advanced international trade and as you know it's uh, been delivered over the next four days and the timings are always the same 2 to 5 pm we'll start sharp at 2 so hopefully uh, everyone can join us on time there will be a break in between uh, for maybe about 10 minutes that we'll decide as we go along some housekeeping rules that apply to everyone uh, make sure that your video and your mic are off um, at all times and if you have questions because we have so many participants it's best if we just post if you guys post it uh, on the chat box that you see on to your right and i'll be moderating these questions and i'll uh, i'll pass them on to asha make sure that you when you post the questions make sure that it's posted to everyone or even me and not to anybody else so that you know, i can pass these questions on asha thanks again and welcome you can start okay uh, thank you very much gautam uh, this is very exciting uh, thank you everyone for coming and hello uh, I actually cannot see any of you. I'm looking at myself uh, and lecturing to myself right now. So it is weird for me. Uh, hopefully it's not as weird for you guys. Uh, so what I want to do is, um, so this course is advanced international trade. So the idea behind the course really is to give you um, a sense of the trade models uh, that are used extensively today uh, because uh, I think I personally, and I don't know about you, uh, I believe in evidence-based uh, policy making that is grounded in uh, firm economic theory. And I think that's the best way to, to make effective policy. So the idea is to really give you a sense of the different trade models. I'm gonna start from the neoclassical models and bring you right up to um, current cutting edge models. I also want to give you some sense of empirical uh, work in international trade using data. And then I want to end by talking about policy. Now, one caveat is we are, there is a lot of content. So I'm going to bring, I'm going to start with neoclassical, which is, uh, you know, in the 1800s. And then I'm going to try and bring you up to 2010 almost with trade theory. So this is quite a lot of content packed uh, into four days. And so the downside of that is that I'm going to have to give you an overview rather than getting into a lot of the nitty gritties. So I am going to pick a few models and give you the details of those models, but otherwise it's going to be um, an overview. And so I hope everyone is uh, okay with that. And I will give you a heads up when we're getting into some of the more burdensome uh, models so that you, you know, I hope you have your favorite beverage, coffee, wine, whatever it is with you so that you can digest uh, some of these heavy models. Uh, so let me start uh, by talking about trade more generally. So uh, I hope everyone can access their chat, uh, the, the chat option so that you can type in responses. I'd like to keep this interactive. It is very difficult with this forum because there's too many participants but I don't want to keep uh, talking. I want some feedback from you. So I hope you have your chat uh, ready. So my question is, uh, trade, trade is, we're hearing a lot about trade in the news these days. So can, uh, can you guys just tell me what comes to mind from the news when we say international trade? What are the big issues that um, people are talking about related to international trade? And I think Gautam, you're going to monitor the the chat, right? Yes. Uh, okay. So if you can one tell second, me what... I'm going to sure. mute all once and unmute. Maybe you can unmute yourself, Asha. Oh, okay. The people who are not on mute, so I'm going to mute them. Right. Okay. Yeah, I did unmute myself. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Gautam, do you see anything um, on chat? One second. I'm doing things. Trade wars. So I think uh, predominantly people are talking about uh, trade wars, free trade versus protectionism, uh, dumping, 
uh, issues related to dumping and anti-dumping duties, protectionism, etc. I think this is the broad theme uh, that is coming up. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so, guys, just another thing. If I go off briefly, I will come back on. So, just wait yeah. patiently. My network isn't uh, great. So, okay. But I, from what I hear from Gautam, I think you guys have uh, basically talked about trade wars. Uh, you've talked about dumping uh, issues, more nationalism, uh, trade barriers, uh, self-reliance, uh, so on and so forth, retaliation, right? So I'm seeing uh, excellent. So what that tells me is that you are very much up to date with the news. You know what is going on with international trade today. That, that's a good so I want to start by this new um, Atmanirbhar Bharat concept that uh, the Prime Minister has been talking about recently. So what I will do is I will show you a video and then what I want you to do again, this is more work for you Gautam, is uh, to just give a sense of what you think. So give a thumbs up if you think this is a good idea and a thumbs down if you think it's a bad idea and then we'll see what uh, the consensus is. The reason I'm doing this is at the end of this course, I'm going to come back to you and ask you what you now think about this uh, this idea. Okay, so let me share the video here. So I hope you can all hear this. I'm going to play the video by the Prime Minister. Corona Sankar Ehame. Local manufacturing, local market, local supply chain, इसका भी महत्व बराबर समझा दिया है। संकट के समय में लोकल ने ही हमारी डिमांड पूरी की है, हमें इस लोकल ने ही बचाया है। लोकल सिर्फ जरूरत नहीं बल्कि हम सबकी जिम्मेदारी है समय ने हमें सिखाया है कि लोकल को हमें अपना जीवन मंत्र बनाना ही होगा आपको आज जो ग्लोबल ब्रांड्स लगते हैं वो भी कभी ऐसे ही बिल्कुल लोकल थे लेकिन जब वहां के लोगों ने उनका इस्तेमाल शुरू किया उनका प्रचार शुरू किया उनकी ब्रांडिंग की उन पर गर्व किया तो वो प्रोडक्ट्स लोकल से ग्लोबल बन गए वो प्रोडक्ट्स लोकल से ग्लोबल बन गए इसलिए आज से हर भारतवासी को अपने लोकल के लिए वोकल बनना है लोकल के लिए वोकल बनना है न सिर्फ लोकल प्रोडक्ट्स खरीदने हैं बल्कि उनका गर्व से प्रचार भी करना है मुझे पूरा विश्वास है कि हमारा देश ऐसा कर सकता है आपके प्रयास होने तो हर बार आपके प्रति मेरी श्रद्धा को और बढ़ाया है मैं गर्व के साथ एक बात महसूस करता हूं याद करता हूं जब मैंने आपसे देश से खादी खरीदने का आग्रह किया था ये भी कहा था कि देश के हैंडलूम वर्कर्स को सपोर्ट करें आप देखिए बहुत ही कम समय में खादी और हैंडलूम दोनों को ही डिमांड और बिक्री रिकॉर्ड स्तर पर पहुंच गई इतना ही नहीं उसे आपने बड़ा ब्रांड भी बना दिया बहुत छोटा सा प्रयास था लेकिन परिणाम मिला बहुत अच्छा परिणाम मिला साथियों सभी एक्सपर्ट्स बताते हैं साइंटिस्ट बताते हैं कि कोरोना लंबे समय तक हमारे जीवन का हिस्सा बना रहेगा लेकिन साथ ही हम ऐसा भी नहीं होने दे सकते कि हमारी जिंदगी सिर्फ और सिर्फ 
कोरोना के इर्द गिर्द ही सिमट कर रह जाए हम मास्क पहनेंगे दो गज दूरी का पालन करेंगे लेकिन अपने लक्ष्यों को दूर नहीं होने देंगे और स्क्रीन can everyone see the powerpoint again yes. got are you yeah. able to see okay so uh, any impressions good idea bad idea uh there are few responses thumbs down going back to ambassador sort of days when you have just one choice to buy a some right. some yes. say that's it's good idea uh, so it's a mix of responses and depends okay. on implementation etc yes so great so basically a mix of responses some of you think it's a good idea uh, some of you think it's not a very good idea because uh, we're going back to the ambassador days right of um, when you just had two options two or three options with cars not enough variety right, right. so uh, that's uh, fantastic so we have a mix and what we're going to do now is to uh, go through the course and then at the very end i will ask you again and we'll see if we have more good ideas or bad ideas okay so that's the plan now the whole deal with this atmanirbhar idea is about self reliance self sufficiency uh, how can you do that well this is where with implementation the issues are so some of the ideas that are being thrown about uh, is ideas like let's boost our infrastructure spending let's upskill let's make sure that our exporters are competitive right but then there is also this other idea that in order to do so you have to actually um, raise barriers to trade right so you have to substitute away from imports you have to buy local you have to become more vocal for local right so that's the idea now the question is where is the line between becoming protectionist and 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 then where is the line where where do we say let's be self reliant let's boost export competitiveness let's export right so that's the whole spectrum and we're going to talk a lot more about this as we move on in the course so the first thing i want to do is make one single point which is that international trade today looks very very different from what it looked like let's say 30 years ago and some of the big uh, a lot of policy makers and i work with a lot of policy makers in different countries i have worked with policy makers in new zealand in the us uh, south africa and so on everywhere uh, what i see is a lot of policy works on inertia so policy makers are still thinking about international trade like we thought about it let's say 30 years ago but trade today is very different how is it different well the first thing is there is an immense amount of differentiation uh within sectors across products right so we don't really talk about say a shirt today okay there's uh within shirts you're going to see a whole lot of differentiation shirts from china shirts from india shirts from bangladesh shirts from italy these are not the same type of shirt there's immense differentiation both vertical and horizontal across products within sector so it doesn't really make sense for me to say india exports shirts okay because i have to say is it a designer shirt is it cotton shirts is it silk shirts and so on and so forth now this is even more relevant for sectors that are more complex right so think cars uh, pharmaceuticals more high tech sectors you have a lot more differentiation uh, within sectors across products in these types of high tech industries so that's point number 1 now the link that i have provided to you there it takes you to comtrade data it's a un uh, database those of you who work with trade data probably already know this database it gives you trade flows tariff information etc for each country across products right and what you see is you have aggregation to the hs 6 digit level so hs is the harmonized system of uh, coding products and comtrade will tell you about trade flows at the hs 6 digit which is quite disaggregated so you're going to see things like white shirts uh, with silk thread for example right that's the level of disaggregation we're talking about in the hs system so it's a complex world with a whole range of products within sectors 
So don't think when I say trade in cars, you now know that it is, it's not just a car. There are a billion varieties of cars that we're thinking about. The second point is trade today works within global value chains, right? So there is immense fragmentation of production. Now the link I gave you there, unfortunately, I don't have the time to play that, but it's a very interesting uh, NPR documentary. NPR is the national public radio in the United States. And they have this uh, documentary that tracks a t-shirt, right? So they're looking at how a t-shirt is made. And what they show you is how the cotton that is grown in the United States is then sent across to Asia to make it into yarn. And then the yarn is made into fabric, right? For that, the t-shirt actually travels to Colombia. The yarn is made into fabric in Colombia. And then from there, it is then moved back to Bangladesh, which is where the apparel manufacturing happens. And then from Bangladesh, it's moved back to the US. Okay. So what does that mean? That means a production activity is today extremely fragmented. You have inputs moving back and forth multiple times between borders, and then it gets assembled into the final product, which is then taken to the final market. Right. So when you say something like China exports the iPhone, uh, what that does is it's not really that China is exporting the entire iPhone. So can anyone tell me uh, what the value added of China is to an iPhone? So if you know the iPhone costs a lot of money, right? So in the US, it would cost you six hundred dollar minimum. OK, so what is China's value added in this iPhone? Oh, yeah, some dollars, people are too. talking about which components and some other talking about in terms of percentage uh, yes. of total value added. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, we were looking for percentage. People range from 10 to 30 uh, percent. Minimum I've seen here and max is about 70 percent. Yeah, so I would say 60. Yeah, so it's definitely not in the 60 to 70 percent. It's more in the 10 percent range. OK, so that is and the reason for that is if you look at where the iPhone uh, inputs are sourced, it's, for example, the um, the rare earth metals that go into the iPhone, they come from Mongolia, for example, chips, uh, gyroscopes, etc., are made in Japan. They're made in Europe. Right. The, so the design is entirely in the US and that's a major chunk of the iPhone right in terms of value. So if you combine all of that, China's contribution to the iPhone is very, very low. So when we calculate these trade deficits, so the Trump administration goes on and on about the US's trade deficit with China. Now, it is true that the US is running a trade deficit with China, but that doesn't take into account the fact that an exported iPhone going from China to the US is not all made in China, right? Only 10% of that iPhone is going from China to the US. Now, when you start taking into account value added trade and when you start measuring trade in value added terms, what you find is that these deficits are not as big as people think they are. Okay. So that is one big indication coming from the fact that trade today is very, very different from trade 30 years ago. So this is why I wanted to make these points, because when you're thinking about international trade, I don't want you to think about, you know, uh, uh, iPhones being exported, made in China, all made in China, then exported to the US. That's not what I want you to think about. What I want you to think is a global value chain. Right? They actually, uh, the chain, it, it's all now a question of how countries slot Global value chain. That's what uh, policymakers have to be worried about today. Okay. Now, there is another concept that I won't touch upon, which is trade and services. And I won't have time to do that, but a lot of international trade today is not just in goods. In fact, most trade happens in services. We don't have very well established theories for trade and services, so I'm not going to talk about it. But those of you who are interested, I can always point you to the right people who are working in uh, working on trade and services right and uh, it is important for india because india a lot of indian trade happens in in software etc so it is an important area uh, so i have what i've done on this slide is i have told you what are well, how is trade different today so how do we think about trade and what are the implications there are implications for the way we calculate trade deficits and so on and so forth uh, any questions before i move on
Anything that I should note? Okay. So one second. Uh, I think the yeah financial services trade in those. Uh, yeah. No, I think. Uh, okay. Everything's not so. Here's what we're going to do. So we're going to explore some theories of international trade, the prominent ones. As I said, I'll go from neoclassical all the way to new uh, trade theory. Uh, we will briefly also talk about evidence, right? So does the data support these theories? What theories are supported by the data? Uh, if they're not, then we will ask why not, right? Do we just do away with the theory or is it that we have to relax some of the assumptions that are made? Now, we're going to have one session, uh, which is some experience with data. Oh, sorry. Am, is my is my voice OK? Can everyone I hear? I think uh, there are some people who say that it's uh, breaking, but I think uh, for me, it's perfectly audible. Uh, and everyone okay. else also seems to be saying the same. Maybe do people um, want me to go off video? I can do that to see if it improves. Yeah, uh, maybe we can try that once. Okay, so I'm going to go off video. Sure. Okay, so we're going to get hands on experience with data. Now I'm going to ask you towards the end of this session uh, to pick one topic. I'm going to give you a choice. So I will give you a choice between two empirical estimation topics and I'll ask you to pick one. Uh, you can take a poll and we'll see what people come up with. Um, and we're going to work on the data in the third lecture. So the third lecture is going to be more about estimation and uh, playing with the data. And then the final lecture will be about trade policy. So as I said, I believe in evidence-based uh, policy making that is grounded in theory. So the idea is that we get a good sense of the theory, uh, play around with the data a little bit, look at evidence, and then we can talk about um, policy. Okay, so that's the plan for the for the four days. Okay, so now there are going to be some questions that we're going to keep coming back to throughout uh, today and then also tomorrow as we're talking about the models. So as we talk about the trade models, we will keep these questions at the back of our minds and we'll keep coming back to these questions. The first thing we're going to ask is why do countries trade? Right? So is trade a good thing? Why do they do it? Right. The second thing we're going to ask is why do countries trade the way they do? In other words, why do we see the patterns of trade that we see in the world today? Why does India export textiles? Why doesn't it export aircraft? Right. Why does uh, the US export mostly aircraft? Why doesn't it export apparel, for instance? So we're going to look at the patterns and try to get at these patterns. The third question is. Is trade a good thing always? Are there going to be winners and losers? Right. So that is the last question. So if everyone does, everyone benefit. First question. If it is not the case that everyone benefits, then who loses and who gains? Right. So what are the distributional impacts? So we're going to ask these questions. So I want you to have these questions at the back of your mind as we go through the different trade models. So here's a brief introduction for neoclassical trade theory. So the neoclassical models, we have two big ones. First is the Ricardian model of trade, right? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And then we're going to move on to what we call the factor endowment based model. So hexture olein So what is the hexture olein HO model of trade? It basically tells us that countries trade the way they do because they have different endowments. Right. So these two models are the big sort of benchmark models in neoclassical trade theory. The Ricardian model tells us countries trade because different countries are good at different things. Right. And the hexter olin model, which is the factor endowment based model, tells us countries trade the way they do because they're endowed differently. They have different endowments. So let's talk about the Ricardian model first, and then we'll go on to talk about um, factor endowments, right? So one example would be the Ricardian model would tell us that, uh, say, Bangladesh exports garments because it's good at making garments, right? It's the cost of making garments is very low. It's competitive in that sense, and that is why it exports garments. The Hexter-Olin model would say Bangladesh exports garments because it has 
abundant unskilled labor. It's an it's a labor abundant country. It's endowed with a lot of unskilled labor, and that is why it would export uh, garments. Right. So these are the two different models uh, in neoclassical trade theory. We will then start talking about new trade theory, but that comes later. That that's a more uh, recent development. Okay. So now one to note with these uh, neoclassical models is they make a lot of assumptions right because this is our starting point so most of these models are what we call two by two by two now when i say two by two by two what i mean is it's a two country two sector two factors of production model right so it's quite limited in a sense uh, but you will see that it can get qu quickly complicated even with a two by two by two now, of course, these things have been relaxed. So people have come up with extensions where they relax the two by two by two. And we're going to look at some of those uh, those extensions as well. Uh, but again, as I said, we are we're short on time. So I'm not going to be able to give you all the extensions. I will point you towards a few of them. Constant returns to scale is another example, CRS. That is also an assumption that a lot of these uh, neoclassical trade models will make. And then the third assumption that they make is they assume homogeneous agents. Now, when I say agents, I typically mean firms, right? So they're going to assume that all firms in the sector are going to look the same. Okay? So there's very less of what is going on within a sector. Now, already you can see the tension between this and what I told you about international trade today, right? So when I started, I told you, look, trade today is complex. So even within a sector, you're going to have, say, cars, you're going to have Ferraris, and you're going to have your Toyotas, right? And you're going to have your Maruzis. So these are very different. There's a lot of heterogeneity uh, within sectors. Uh, maybe I could just button with one question that was yes. asked here. So yes. how is the neoclassical thought defined in trade and how do we segregate uh, this uh, or identify this rule of thought? Yes, so that is exactly what we're doing here. So the neoclassical models make these different, these assumptions, right? So they are, it's about homogenous agents and constant returns to scale. Now, the, the thing that new trade theory does and the, really the starting of new trade theory is in the 1970s with the Krugman uh, models. Okay. So what those models do is they relax this assumption of constant returns to scale and we move on to what happens when there's increasing returns to scale. That's one thing. We also, the other distinction is we're going to start talking a lot more about heterogeneity within sectors, while the sort of neoclassical models talk about sectors as a whole. What goes on within a sector, it's a sector is a black box. You don't know what goes on within the sector. Right? And the final thing that is different between neoclassical and new trade theory is this idea of intra-industry trade. Right? So what is intra-industry trade? This is the idea that countries trade within an industry. Right? So the neoclassical models are really focusing on differences between countries. So Bangladesh versus United States, right? Bangladesh, unskilled labor abundant, United States, high skilled labor abundant. So these countries are different. And so Bangladesh will export uh, garments, US will export aircraft. That's the whole idea behind uh, these neoclassical. They focus on differences between countries. And so because countries are so different, they're going to export and import different things. Whereas in these new, new trade theory models, what you will see is India will export cars, but it will also import cars. Right? So you're going to get intra-industry trade, countries importing and exporting within the same sector. And that's very, that's new. You, you don't find that in the neoclassical uh, models. So when I say neoclassical trade theory, just think that's just jargon. So just think Ricardian and Hexerolene type models. And when I say new trade theory, we'll, we'll talk, of course, more about that. But that's starting from the Krugman kind of monopolistic competition type models. Okay. But but trust me, you, you will learn a lot more about this as we as we go along. Uh, any other questions, Gautam? Anything pressing? I should tackle? No, I think we can go. Okay, so what assumptions will be relaxed as we go along? We're going to say, look, if we want to be realistic, we need, a, we need models where there are many countries and we need models where there are infinite products. 
What happens when the what increase in returns to scale? That's another question we'll ask. And then finally, we will also talk about the idea that there's immense amount of heterogeneity within sectors and across firms. So we'll, we'll start with the basic models, relax the assumptions, and that will take us to the new, uh, the new trade models. Okay, so here is the structure. Today, I'm gonna talk about mostly the Ricardian model. The second uh, lecture tomorrow will be about the factor endowment models, which is HO, hexterolene. Uh, and then we will start new trade theory. So new trade theory, we'll start by talking about Krugman's uh, monopolistic competition model. So that will be more about trade and imperfect competition. Uh, then I will take you to the most used model in modern uh, trade theory, which is the Mellitz uh, model, which talks about trade and heterogeneous forms. Uh, lecture three is going to be a computer session, so I will be working uh, with data on the screen and you can follow me. I'm hoping everyone is uh, more or less familiar with how Stata works. If not, it's not a terribly difficult um, software to pick up, so I don't anticipate you will have uh, issues. And then finally, we're going to end with trade policy. Uh, now here, let me talk briefly about empirical exercises. So I have two empirical um, exercises in mind and I want you to pick one. So we'll run a poll and see who wants to do, um, who wants to pick what and then, uh, you know, whoever votes. So we'll look at who gets which model, right? Or which exercise gets the most votes. Uh, the first one is the gravity model. So this is good for people who want to do policy work. So if you're the type of person who wants to look at how do, how do these different trade policies or even environmental policies, etc., impact international trade, then the gravity model is good for you. The other exercise I have in mind is firm productivity and performance. Now, this is really, I would say, at the um, frontier. Okay? So here, what we do is we look at firm level data and we're going to look at how do we estimate firm productivity. Now, what you will see is with productivity is uh, also comes this idea of markups, right? So it's very hard to disentangle productivity and markups that firms are charging. So I'm going to spend a little bit bit of time talking about how do we estimate productivity and then also markups. So the first is going to be gravity, which is really about trade flows between countries. And the second exercise is the firm one where we'll use firm level data. And for both of these, I will be using Stata. So the package is the same. It's just that these are two different topics. So when we run the poll, please vote for whichever one you want me to do. And then whichever gets the max votes, I'll do that. Okay. So we are so, commenting here, but I just want to clarify that there will be a, a poll at the end of today and you can vote there. Uh, the yes. comments that Most you hear will not be counted. Yes, please, um, please vote in the poll because that will be the official poll. So if you put in comments here, then yeah, they won't count. Yeah. Okay. Uh, resources. So those of you who want to take this further can always more resources, but these are really the, the texts uh, that a lot of the slides are based on. So Feenstra has an advanced international trade textbook, which is extremely readable and very, very useful. So for those of you who want to pursue uh, international trade at a more advanced level, I would recommend that um, textbook to you. There are some additional texts uh, here that I have listed, but really Feenstra is sort of the baseline. Uh, these additional texts are good for certain topics. Again, I'm happy to give you more direction if you're interested. I hope a lot of you have seen the syllabus. I have posted a lot of readings. So those are really the papers that talk about these different models. Um, and uh, as we go along, you will see uh, that we refer to those papers uh, quite a bit. Yeah. And I, I will be talking about a lot of those papers. Some of them are complicated. Uh, so, you know, you will have to sit down with pen and paper uh, to go, go through some of these. My idea is really to provide an overview. All right, so let's now jump right in. We're going to start with the Ricardian model, which is a two by two. Now, when I say two by two, what I mean is it's a two country, two sector model. Now, what I'm going to do is I will do the baseline model. A lot of you must be familiar. If you have some training in economics, you are familiar with some of these concepts, right? Uh, in the two by two Ricardian model, but I'll still go through them quickly so that we're all on the same page. Uh, 
and then I'm going to extend that model to multiple countries and multiple goods. So we are going to do two, ex, um, two models that are extensions. The first is the Don Bush Fisher Samuelson model. And the second one is the Eaton Cortum model. Now, when I do the Eaton Cortum uh, model, uh, those of you who are interested in gravity uh, will know that Eaton Cortum is actually one of the ways in which you can provide a uh, theoretical foundation for the gravity model. So the Eaton Cortum model is very useful because, in a sense, it provides the theoretical um, foundation for the gravity model of trade, which is a very popular empirical model. The, the other thing about the Ricardian model is it's very useful to talk about productivity and competitiveness. So all of this about export competitiveness, right, that we hear in the news, how do we make India competitive? Uh, all of that, we can really talk about that nicely in the context of the, the Ricardian model. Okay, so let me talk about comparative advantage. Most of you must be familiar with this. If you have an econ background, you know what comparative advantage is. But you will be amazed at how hard it is for um, people who are not familiar with this to get their head around this, right? It's not such a, an intuitive concept to grasp, but it is really at the, at the bottom of international trade. So why do countries trade? They trade because different countries have a comparative advantage in different things. So comparative advantage is the driver of international trade. Okay, so if someone asks you what drives trade, the answer is easy, it's comparative advantage. So let's do a thought experiment here. How many of you know, we all know who Indira Nui is, right? The, the ex-CEO uh, of Pepsi. Do you know who Ruth Porat is? Uh, so Ruth Porat is um, the ex-CFO of Alphabet, which is Google's uh, parent company. Okay. So here we have, now this is all made up, right? These are made up numbers. So what we have here are unit labor requirements. Now, what is a unit labor requirement? A unit labor requirement is how many hours does it take for someone to do, uh, uh, to perform a particular task or to produce a particular commodity? So it's the hours per unit. In a sense, it, it gives you what productivity is. So if you look at this table, what this tells you is there are two tasks, right? Managing investments and cooking. Now, Ruth and Indira have these different uh, unit labor requirements for these tasks. So what these numbers tell you is how many hours uh, Ruth needs to manage investments per unit and how many hours she needs to cook per unit, right? Now, if you stare at this table and look at these unit labor requirements for Ruth and Indira for the two tasks, is there anything that uh, jumps to mind? What can you see? What can you tell me from here? Do these numbers tell you anything? Anyone? I don't think people are, Ruth is efficient in both the things. I think. So, Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So very good. So what you will notice here is Ruth is actually better at doing both things, right? Because it only takes her one hour to manage investments, whereas it takes Indira six hours, and it only takes her two hours to cook, right? Whereas it takes Indira four hours. So in trade terminology, what we say, and I think someone is picking this up here, is that Ruth has an absolute advantage in both tasks. Okay, And uh, so that's the first point to note. Now, let's look at how bad Indira is relative to Ruth. Now, if you look at managing investments, then you will see that Indira needs almost six times more right, to manage investments. However, if you look at to cook, she only needs two times more time to cook. Right. So what this tells us is that relatively speaking, Indira is better at cooking, right, compared to Ruth, uh, than in managing investments. Because in managing investments, she's just really bad relative to Ruth. But in cooking, she's not as bad. So what that means in again in trade language, it means that Indira has a comparative advantage in cooking relative to Ruth. Now, this may sound uh, really weird because you might say, well, Indira doesn't sound like she has an advantage in anything. 
right? But note that it is comparative advantage. It's not absolute advantage. So we have to be very careful. We always look for relatives in international trade. So trade is all about relatives. It's not about the absolutes. Okay. So now let's talk about what should they do? How should they allocate time during the day? So, uh, Gautam, is it true? Is the text clear? Because I'm hearing, I'm seeing people. Uh, no, people. actually, they're right. It is a bit blurred, but I think it may have to do, maybe has to do with the connection. Um, I see. I see. I don't, uh, let's try to figure this out. I'll try to figure this out. But overall, it's okay. I think only when it's like, uh, like in this slide, it's not as clear. If you go to the next slide, uh, where you have bigger text, I think it's no more clearer. Um, okay. Ashik, uh, later you could actually mail it to us and we yeah. can share it with everyone. Yes, uh, yes. If, I think we'll do it during the break or something. Yeah, we can. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So let me move on then. So let's look at all the different options about how they can allocate time. Okay. So the first option is that they're not trading. So this is autarky. Now, when I say autarky, that is again, trade jargon for no trade. So countries are not trading. They are basically islands, right? So that is what we, that's called autarky. Now, if there's no trade and it's autarky, uh, that means both of them are going to do their own thing. So Ruth is going to manage her investments and she's going to cook. And Indira is going to manage her investments and she's going to cook for herself. Okay. There is another option, which is what we call trade A, option A, which is that Ruth is going to do what she is relatively better at and Indira is going to do what she is relatively better at. So we have already established that Indira is relatively right, better at cooking, and Ruth is relatively better at managing investments. So option A is Ruth does the investments for both of them, and Indira does the cooking for both of them, right? And then they just trade. So that's a trade A scenario. Trade B is the opposite. So this is where Indira does the investments and Ruth cooks. Now, it is fairly straightforward to calculate the hours under each of these options for both Ruth and Indira, right? So if there's no trade, then Ruth is going to take three hours to do both her investments and her cooking. Okay? And Indira is going to take 10 hours, which is basically six plus four, uh, to do her cooking and investments. Whereas if you do trade A, where Ruth does the investments, Indira does the cooking for both of them, then what you see is the total hours that Ruth is going to spend is only two, because it's one times two, right, for, for managing investments. And for Indira, it's just four times two right? Because she's only doing the cooking. And so the hours are two and eight under trade A. And under trade B, the hours similarly calculated are four and 12. Now, when you compare these options, what you will see is it is always better to go for trade A. Okay? So trade A is strictly better for both Ruth and Indira, right? So this is telling us that specializing in what you're good at and then trading is always better than just doing everything by yourself, right? Which is managing investments and cooking. And that's not shocking for Indira because remember that she is not really good at either compared to Ruth. But what the, the counterintuitive thing here is that it's also a good idea for Ruth to do this. So a lot of people will say things like, oh, why does Germany have to trade? Or what gain, what, how does the U.S. really gain from trade? Because Germany, U.S., these countries are probably better at doing everything relative to other countries. So why should they trade? This is a very common idea you will hear um, in advanced countries. But because of comparative advantage, it actually makes sense even for countries like the U.S. and Germany that may have an absolute advantage in everything to still specialize in what they're good at and engage in international trade. Okay? So this is a fundamental point that we want to remember. Why is trade useful? Why is it? Why does it improve life? Because of this principle of comparative advantage. Uh, any questions before we move on? So we're going to formalize this in the Ricardian model. No, I think uh, somebody just pointed out that maybe zooming out helps with the reading, but there are no other. Oh, so we uh, OK. I see. There is a button on the left uh, to zoom and zoom out. It's okay. So people so can. So should I uh, be? I should be zooming. This? No, no. I think saying? it's for the participants. For the participants. Have to do that. You don't have to do it. Okay. Okay. 
So let's formalize this. This um, so. Ricardo initially had this example of wine and cloth, right? Portugal and uh, the UK. But I have uh, basically changed it a little bit. And we are now talking about Australia and Brazil. And the two commodities we're talking about are going to be wool and coffee. Okay. So now we have the standard table that we saw, which gives us the unit labor requirements. Okay. So Australia needs one hour to make one unit of wool, uh, and it needs two hours to make uh, a unit of coffee. Okay? And similarly for Brazil, it's six and three for wool and coffee. Now again, what we see is Australia has an absolute advantage in both wool and coffee, while Brazil has um, a, an absolute advantage. Now, where do these unit labor requirements come from? So what determines the number of hours that it takes to make wool or coffee in each of these countries. Well, the unit labor requirements really come from technology, right? So the idea is the engineers in these countries will tell us how much, given the current technology in the country, how many hours labor requires to produce these goods, right? So these unit labor requirements come from technology, so they're uh, driven by technological differences. The other thing to note is this notation here. So the notation A, L, W, A, A, L, W means this is the unit labor requirement for Australia in wool. Okay, so that's the notation. A, A, L, C is what Australia needs to make coffee. Okay? And this is the inverse of productivity. So unit labor requirement is the inverse of productivity. Higher the unit labor requirement, lower the productivity of a particular country in that in that particular sector. Okay, clear? Now, we're gonna talk about how trade happens, right? So one thing we're gonna talk about is we have these technological differences. How is that going to determine how international trade occurs? So let's think back to the colonial times, right? So we are, let's say we are in the 1800s. Uh, we are in the uh, Arabian Sea. There is a ship that set out from Kenya. It's carrying, let's say, coffee. There is a ship that set out from India, and it is carrying pepper, right? Now, both of these ships sit in the middle of the Arabian Sea, and they each see that they have different products, right? So the Indians are now interested in the coffee. Kenyans are interested in the pepper, okay? What's the first thing that they're going to ask each other? Excellent. Yes. So I think Kaushal Indra has said price. Yes. Very good. So price is the key thing, right? The first thing you want to know with uh, trade is what is the price? Because any exchange, you're going to want to know uh, what the price is. So the Kenyans want to know what the price of pepper is. The Indians want to know what the price of coffee is, because that will then determine how they exchange coffee and pepper. Okay. So what we're going to do is we are going to look at the opportunity costs of producing both of these goods in these two countries, Brazil and Australia. That will give us a sense of what the autarky prices are going to be in the two countries. Okay. okay, so let's talk about Australia. What is the opportunity cost of producing one unit of wool in Australia? So if you're using one unit of wool, then you're going to spend one hour, right? And so that means that you're going to sacrifice one half units of coffee. So that means that the opportunity cost of producing one unit of wool is half unit of coffee. So that's one half. And again, I'm talking about an autarky situation here, no trade, right? So let's talk about Brazil. What is the opportunity cost of producing one unit of wool, which means you use up six hours, you're going to end up sacrificing two units of coffee. So two is the opportunity cost of one unit of wool in terms of coffee before trade. Now, what we're going to see is these numbers are going to tell us what the autarky prices are going to be. And the autarky prices will tell us whether it's going to be beneficial to trade or not. Okay, okay so let's look at the equilibrium uh, in autarky. So if you look at Australia, if you want equilibrium, what you want is that the workers in Australia and remember here, labor is the only factor of production. So workers are going to be paid their marginal product in both sectors, right? So in Australia, the Australian wage is going to be equal to the value of the marginal product of labor in wool 
Okay, so remember that's P W times the productivity and note that the productivity is just the inverse of the unit labor requirement. Okay, so that's going to be P W over one and that has to equal the uh, value of the marginal product of labor in coffee. So PC over two. Now, once you look at that equilibrium, what that tells me is that the relative price of wool is going to be one half before trade in Australia. Similarly, in Brazil, we can calculate what PW over PC is going to be because we know that wage in Brazil has to be equal to the value of the marginal products of labor in both sectors in Brazil. So PW over PC Brazil is going to be two. Okay. Now, what this is telling us is that the autarky price of wool in Australia is much lower than the autarky price of wool in Brazil. What that tells us is that Australia has a comparative advantage in wool and Brazil has a comparative advantage in coffee. So the first thing we want to note is the autarky prices are a signal of comparative advantage. So in any trade model, if you want to see which country has a comparative advantage in which sector, all you need to do is look at the autarky relative prices for that commodity in both countries. Whichever country has the lower relative autarky price for that product has a comparative advantage in that product. Okay? So we say that autarky prices are a signal of comparative advantage. So that's one thing so that's you want to hardwire in our brains. Autarky price, relative autarky price signals comparative advantage. Okay? Now, we know what the prices are in Australia and Brazil in autarky. Now, suppose these countries open up to trade, then what is going to happen in equilibrium? So in equilibrium, the trade price right, is going to be somewhere in between the two autarky prices. So the post-trade relative price is going to lie. We're going to call that PW over PC star. So anytime I say star, it means it's the um, trading price. Right? So the trading price is going to lie in between the two autarky prices. So let's look at the Ricardian model graphically. So I'm going to graph the two countries here. So we have Australia on the left. We have Brazil on the right. We have wool on the x-axis, coffee on the y-axis. Can anyone tell me what these blue and red lines are? What do they denote? They're giving us essentially the slope of these lines. If you notice, the slope of that line uh, on the left, the blue line, is one half, right? And the slope on the right is two. So on the left, we're tracking the opportunity cost in Australia, right? of coffee relative to wool. And here we're tracking the same, the opportunity cost in Brazil. There is another word for these. It's called the production possibility frontier. Okay. So the production possibility frontier in Australia has the slope of one half. In Brazil, it has the slope of two. Now, in autarky, the prices, the ratio of prices, right? We calculated that on the previous slide. We saw that the price of wool to coffee is one half in Australia and the price of wool to coffee in Brazil is two. So in autarky, in the Ricardian model, what happens is that the relative prices are superimposed upon the PPF, right? In other words, the price line, which gives us the ratio of prices of both of these commodities, lies on top of the production possibility frontier. Why is that? Because in autarky, equilibrium means that the relative price of these two commodities has to equal the opportunity cost. Okay. And the same applies in Brazil. So the reason I have drawn a blue line and the red line is that in both of these countries, in autarky equilibrium, the relative prices have to have have to be the same as the opportunity cost. So they're superimposed upon the production possibility frontier. So the PPF gives us the opportunity cost. The price ratio has to lie on the PPF because the price ratio has to equal the opportunity cost. Okay, so is that clear? So the PPF is different from the price line, which gives you the relative prices. Okay. 
Now, what we're going to do is to get at equilibrium in autarky, we cannot forget the consumer. So once we throw the consumer in, we're going to do that by putting in the indifference curve for the representative consumer. One thing we will assume in most trade models is that consumers are exactly alike across countries, right? So trade has very little to say on demand. Most of the action comes from the supply side. So we're going to assume that consumers have homothetic preferences and these preferences are exactly the same across countries. So the indifference curves in Australia and Brazil are going to look the same. Now you might tell me that's not realistic. I agree, right? But trade theory really focuses more on the supply side. So let's bring in the consumer. What is equilibrium in autarky? General equilibrium means both production and consumption equilibrium. So we're going to put the indifference curve on here and we're going to look at the point where that indifference curve is tangent to the PPF. Because remember that you have a constraint, right? The production possibility frontier gives you the constraint and the tangency is where uh, you have utility maximization subject to that constraint. Okay? So this the intersection between the consumer's indifference curve and that PPF for Australia is the autarky equilibrium in Australia. And then we can do the same thing for Brazil. The consumer indifference curve tangent to the PPF gives the autarky equilibrium in Brazil. Okay. Now, talk about gains from trade. Remember, I said we'll keep coming back to the same questions, right? So we have answered the first question with the Ricardian model. Why do countries trade? Countries trade because they have each country has a comparative advantage in a different good. Ricardo says comparative advantage comes from technological differences. Technology is different in different countries. Labor productivity is hence different in these different countries. And that gives these different countries a comparative advantage in certain goods. And that is why they trade. Okay? So that's reflected in the different slopes that you see here. The difference in the slope of the production possibility frontier comes from technological differences. The fact that unit labor requirements are so different in these different countries. The second question, is trade a good thing? Are there going to be gains from trade? So what happens when countries open up to trade? The price lines are going to rotate. Okay, so what happens in Australia? Well, Australia has a comparative advantage in wool. If it has a comparative advantage in wool with international trade, we know that the price of wool relative to coffee is going to go up, right? So in autarky, the price of wool relative to coffee in Australia was one half. After international trade, Brazilians are going to start demanding Australian coffee because in Brazil, the coffee costs two units or rupees or dollars. In Australia, it only costs one half. Brazilians start demanding um, Australian wool, right? Which means that the price of wool relative to coffee goes up and it is going to stabilize at a trading equilibrium somewhere in between one half and two. So in other words, for Australia, the price line is going to become steeper okay, with a slope greater than one half, but less than two. And that is what this rotation of the blue line is picking up. So what Australia is going to do is it is going to specialize in the production of wool. So there's going to be complete specialization because note that they're now getting a lot more for their wool and one half, right? So all the resources of Australia are going to go get sucked in into the wool sector. Australia specializes in wool. The line, the price line has rotated, which means consumers are going to be able to trade to a higher indifference curve. So you can now move up to a higher indifference curve such that it is tangent to the price line. Similarly, for Brazil, the opposite happens. The price line, now we're, we can think about this from the coffee point of view, right? So if the price of wool relative to coffee is two in Brazil, the price of coffee relative to wool is one half, right? And so the price line for Brazil becomes flatter than the earlier dark red line. Okay. So what Brazilians are going to do is now there's more demand for Brazilian coffee from the Australians, because the Australians are going to see that Brazilian coffee is cheaper. They're going to demand more Brazilian coffee. That's going to raise the price of relative price of coffee. Okay. 
And so you're going to have this rotation of the price line and consumers are going to be able to trade up to a higher indifference curve in Brazil as well. Note that one thing is both countries specialize in their in the products that they have a comparative advantage in. So Ricardian model, complete specialization. Australia is only making wool. Brazil is only making coffee. And then consumers are trading up to a higher indifference curve where here's the consumption equilibrium. The consumption equilibrium is not at the production equilibrium. So in international trade, you don't have to produce where you consume, right? You can consume at a different consumption point relative to your production point. Both consumers in Australia and Brazil are at higher indifference curve, which means that there is gains from trade. So let me quickly recap before I ask you if you have any questions at this point. So recap. Australia, due to technology, has a comparative advantage in wool. Brazil has a comparative advantage in coffee. When these two countries open up to trade, the price of wool relative to coffee is going to be in between one half and two, right? Between the relative prices in Australia and Brazil and Turkey. Once the price is in between both in Australia and Brazil, Producers in Australia make only wool. Producers in Brazil make only coffee. And then consumers are going to trade up to a different consumption equilibrium, which is at a much higher indifference curve than before. In other words, both countries have gained from trade. Okay. Uh, we do have one question. Questions? Yes. Uh, so this is about the slope of the PPF. So the question is the more advanced technology is the steeper. Uh, the PPF less steeper. Uh, do you want to answer that? I think it depends uh, on which uh, technology. If it is the x-axis technology, then it shifts to the right. Then it will be less steeper. If it's the y-axis right. technology, it will be more uh, steeper. Yeah. So one thing is, look, everything here is relative, right? So if we're talking about, as as Gautam was saying, if it is the technology of wool that you're talking about then flatter um, curve here means better technology, steeper means worse technology. And by worse technology, we mean more hours to make, right? So lower labor productivity. Really, yeah. Uh, any other questions? I think people want you to go over the, uh, maybe I think the comparative advantage calculation. Oh, which one is that? Is that what you guys mean? I'm not sure. I think this one, yeah. I think maybe quickly recap. Okay, so if you are talking about this one, right? So here we are saying is, so there are a few, so let me go backwards. Maybe that will also help. Okay, so one thing is uh, the PPF. Now where, so there are, th if you look at the diagram here, there are three things here. Let's forget the consumer for a minute. We're not gonna talk about the consumer. Let's just talk about the producers. The first thing is the PPF. Now, what is the PPF? The PPF tells us how much of each commodity each country can produce. Okay. Where does it come from? It comes from technology. The engineers tell you about technology, right? And so for that, we're gonna look at these numbers here. So for Australia, it needs one hour per unit to make wool, and it needs two hours to make one unit of coffee, right? So what that means is suppose, Let's say that Australia has, um, let's say 10 worker hours, right? So if it has 10 worker hours, how many units of wool can it make? 10 units, right? So that's how you do the PPF here. So you're gonna plot that. I'm assuming that Australia has 10 workers. So we're gonna put the, uh, the line, the PPF will intersect the X axis at 10. Okay? If it has 10 hours, how much coffee can Australia make? That's going to be, five, right? Because you divide 10 hours, you, you need two hours for coffee per unit. Okay? So you can make five coffees. So that means the slope of this line. So I'm going to put five here. So this line intersects, the PPF intersects the y-axis at five. So that's a five here, that's a 10 here, which means the slope of this line is going to be one half. Okay? And that's a pure technology thing. So technology and the unit labor requirements will give you the PPF for Australia and the PPF for Brazil. And the PPF for Australia is gonna have a slope of half. The PPF for Brazil will have a slope of two. That means that Australia has, has a, a flatter PPF. That means it has better technology to make wool. Now I can say the same thing in terms of coffee, 
So if you flip it, then what you will see is that Brazil has better technology relatively. It has a comparative advantage in coffee rather than wool. Okay? So that's about the PPFs. Now there's a different thing, which is prices. So how are autarky prices determined? Now, in order to do that, we have to look at the um, labor market equilibrium as well in these two countries. So labor market equilibrium says the wage has to be equal to the marginal value of the marginal product of labor in both sectors, right? How do we calculate the value of the marginal product of labor? We take the price of each commodity and multiply by labor productivity. Okay? How do we get labor productivity? Well, that's just the inverse of these, these labor requirements, right? Productivity is inversely related. So that's why I'm, I'm writing this as PW over one, PC over two, similarly PW over six, and PC over three for wool and coffee. Now that gives us the autarky relative prices in equilibrium in autarky in these two countries. And what we find is that that price line, the autarky relative price in equilibrium has the same slope as the PPF, okay? Because that's equilibrium, uh, that's how equilibrium is defined. Now, the minute the prices change, the, the country goes off equilibrium. It no longer produces a combination of two, right? So if the price of, let's say, wool goes up, as will happen when you open up to trade, right? When you open up to trade, the trading price is always going to be higher than one half because Brazilian price of wool in autarky is two, but Australian is half. When you open up to trade, Brazilians start demanding Australian wool and the price rises from one half and then settles somewhere in between one half and two. Okay? So suppose it settles at one. Okay? What, what does that mean for Australia? What that means for Australia is because of this condition here, it now makes sense for all Australians to really focus on the production of wool and give up production of coffee. It's no longer profitable to make coffee, right, in equilibrium. And so that is where you're going to get this specialization. So all Australians will move to the production point here where all the labor is going into wool. Okay? Brazilians will do the opposite. All of them will start making coffee. That's where the production point is going to be. But the consumption point now under e in equilibrium is going to be at a different point. It's not at the production point. It's at a different consumption point. Okay. Does that answer the, the question? I think so. I think we can go. OK. So here are some questions. Who gains most? Do you think? Can anyone answer that? So from the Ricardian model, does Australia gain more or does uh, Brazil gain more? So people are saying it's a win-win both gain, but the question is slightly different. It's, uh, it's asking who gains more. So some say it's Brazil gains more. And uh, okay. depending on the, another comment, say it depends on the common relative price. Very good. Exposed, so I think exposed. Yes, yes, very good. So it really depends on the prices. Okay. So who gains most depends on what's going on with that rotation. So as you can see, if there's a massive rotation, right, what you will see is that that you can get to a much higher indifference curve, right? So it depends on where that price uh, ends up. Okay, this uh, common price post trade is going to end up somewhere in between half and two, right? So depending on where that that uh, lands up and what drives that, that's really world demand and supply, right? So when you have a trading equilibrium, the uh, relative price in under international trade is going to depend upon supply and demand in the global market. It's, it's one market now. Australia and Brazil are part of the same market. So supply and demand conditions in the global market will determine where that post-trade um, price is going to lie. And that will determine how much each country gains, right? Because that will drive how these price lines rotate uh, in the trading equilibrium. Okay? What are the sources of gain? Well, the sources of gain are, it's all comparative advantage, right? So comparative advantage and labor is the only factor of production here. So it's not a good 
I, it, this is not a great model to talk about distributional issues, but essentially everyone gains. Labor is the only factor, so labor gains. And the source of gain is comparative advantage coming from technological differences. Who earns higher wages? Which country do you think? Do Australians earn higher wages? Do, do Brazilians earn higher wages and why? Again, I think it depends on the final price. Uh, that's the common Brazil. Yeah, there are some uh, questions. Uh, I mean, uh, on the previous question about who gains more, there's one question which said, "Does it matter who gains more as long as everybody gains?" I think uh, you want to address that. Sure. So certainly, it doesn't matter uh, who gains more. That's just a question that. Um, that I ask. Uh, it doesn't matter as long as everyone gains and is better off than before, it still makes sense to trade. Okay? Uh, so, it, no, I wouldn't say that it matters who gains most. It's just these are questions just intended to kind of see if you have grasped uh, some of the concepts of the model. Okay? Now, wages. So, let's now. So the next model we're going to talk about is going, we're going to start talking a lot more about competitiveness and wages. Okay. Uh, in terms of energy levels, how is everyone doing? Like, what's a good time to take a break? Do you think one and a half hours? Um, if you have uh, maybe a short topic that you can cover, maybe we can take a break in uh, 10 minutes or so. 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's 320, fine. The, 340. No, 320 yes. is better, I think. And then we'll start again maybe at uh, 330. Okay. That sounds good. All right, so there are two extensions that we are going to talk about today. So what I just spoke about now is the basic Ricardian model, right? So it's a two by two uh, model and most of the um, analysis was done graphically. Uh, but that is important to set the stage for the, the these other models I'm going to talk about. The first one is Dawn Bush uh, Fisher Samuelson okay, in the AER. Now, what does this model do? It essentially says, let's uh, make this more realistic. Let's not just stick to two by two. Let's talk about what happens when there, there's a continuum of um, products, right? So when there are an infinite number of products, how do we talk about the Ricardian model? Do the, the insight go through? Now, the reason I like the Don Bush uh, Fisher Samuelson, I'm going to call this DFS uh, model, is that there are two things you can do with this. The first is it allows you to talk about this idea of export competitiveness and unit labor costs, right? So it's a nice model to talk to do and to if you want to analyze trends in productivity, emerging comparative advantage, which sectors India probably has competitiveness in and so on. It's a nice model to do that. The second thing is it allows us to do some simple comparative statics. So you can talk about what happens uh, to welfare when, say, one of your trading partners uh, has a technological shock, right? So what if there is a productivity shock in China who is a trading partner? What happens if there's population growth uh, in one of your trading partners or, or your, the economy that you're trading with grows massively? So these types of comparative static exercises are done easily in the DFS model. So that's why I like that. And we are going to take, uh, th we'll talk about this. The second model, as I said, is useful because it is the foundation of the gravity model. And it also allows us, it's a structural model. So it allows us to quantify uh, gains from trade. And so that's why I like the Eaton Quarto model. Now, the Eaton Quarto model is a little bit heavier than most of these other models. So, which is why I'm kind of I'm building up uh, to Eaton and Quarto. Okay. So let's jump into DFS. So what I'll do is I will set it up, and then we will come back into um, to talk about the equilibrium. I think that will be a nice place to take a break. So let's extend the Ricardian model. Multiple goods. Uh, so we're going to be looking, most trade models are all general equilibrium. So we're going to be looking at equilibrium in three markets, production, uh, consumer, demand, and then we're going to look at the equilibrium. As I said, trade models mostly focus on production and technology. Assumptions. So perfect competition, okay. identical homothetic tastes. As I said, trade theory doesn't have much to say on consumer uh, heterogeneity. You have a continuum of goods. So this is where the extension comes in. So this is Ricardo two by two extended to an infinite continuum of goods. We have labor endowments. So L is the labor endowment at home. 
L star is the labor endowment in the foreign country. So whenever I say star, just remember that it's foreign. Technology. Technology, as we know, is what drives trade in the Ricardian model. It's what drives competitive advantage. And we're going to denote it as A here. Now, Z is the good, the, um, the continuum of goods we have. So Z indexes goods. And A of Z is simply L of Z divided by Y of Z. Okay. So this is the labor requirement. In other words, how much labor do you need to produce one unit of a particular product? And so that's A, your unit labor requirement. So let's talk about the production equilibrium and we'll bring the, the consumers in. Okay, so the first thing we are going to do is we are going to look at relative productivities. As I said, in international trade, everything is relative, right? So I'm going to define this capital A of Z as equal to A star of Z divided by A of Z. So what is A star divided by A? This is just the productivity of the home country relative to the foreign country. So note that the way this is constructed, it's A star divided by A, and we know that A is the inverse of labor productivity. So be very careful. I often tend to get confused with this. A is the inverse of labor productivity. So because we've written this as A star over A, this is really home productivity relative to foreign productivity. Now, what happens, we're going to um, order this. So we're going to plot on this graph here, figure one, the capital A of Z, which is relative productivity on the y-axis. And we're going to put the goods on a continuum on the x-axis. So the x-axis is Z, which is just a continuum of, of goods. And we have the relative productivities on the y-axis. And as you can see, A of Z is a downward sloping curve. Why is it downward sloping? Because what we've done is we have um, indexed set such that the unit labor requirements are ranked in terms of diminishing home country advantage. Okay. So as A goes up, A uh, capital A of Z goes down. So that's why this is a downward sloping line. And as we know, as A goes up, home becomes less and less productive. So this is diminishing home country um, advantage. Okay. So what does home produce? So home is going to produce all those products where home has the lower price, right? So as long as home has the lower price than foreign for those goods, home has a comparative advantage in that good. Remember, we said that it's all about autarky relative prices, right? So if a country has a lower price relatively, then it has a comparative advantage and it will produce and export that good. That's the Ricardian model. So let's look at how we define prices at home. So P of Z is equal to A times W. And where does this expression come, come from? We have seen this before. This comes from the labor market equilibrium condition. The wage in a country has to be equal to the value of marginal uh, product of labor. And so that's price times one over A, and I can rewrite that as P equals A times W. Similarly, we have P star equals A star times W star. So P and P star give us the prices in each country for the good Z. When does home produce a particular good Z? Home produces Z if home can make it cheaper. It's more competitive in Z. In other words, P of Z is less than or equal to P star of Z. Home has the cheaper price. Okay. So that means A times W is less than or equal to A star times W star. So those are the Zs for which home is going to be producing and exporting. Now I can rewrite that as W over W star is less than or equal to A, capital A of Z, which is just the ratio of relative productivities. In other words, as long as the relative wage is less than or equal to relative productivities, then my cost of making uh, those products is lower, my prices are lower, and I have a comparative advantage, which means I will produce and export. Okay, so if I were to draw the W over W star line here, right? So just a horizontal line at W over W star, then the point, I can look for the point at which that line intersects the capital A of Z curve, 
And once I get the intersection, I can look at Z1 right here on the graph. And what that tells me is that to the left of Z1, right, W over W star is less than A star over A. In other words, home has the lower price for those products. And so home will produce and export those products. On the right, to the right of Z1, what happens is that W over W star is actually greater than A star over A. In other words, home is not relatively um, uh, competitive, right? So foreign is more competitive in those products. And so foreign will produce those products and home will simply import those products. So it's much cheaper for home to import those products. Uh, Gotham is, should I stop now? Because we're then going to move on to the consumer and then put the two together to go to the um, equilibrium. I think, uh, yeah, that sounds good. Okay. I think one comment uh, is asking if we can uh, share the slides during the break. I think we can do that. Uh, maybe yes. One, Asha, if you can send me the slides, I'll just send it to you. Yes, I can do that. So um, should we break for... Uh, say, how how long do you think? Like 10 minutes or? Yeah, we can start at 3.30. Okay. Let's so keep let's... the thing running so that, you know, we can just mute ourselves. Asha, maybe you can mute as well. And uh, okay. do whatever and then come back 10 or 15. Let's say 15 minutes. People want 15 minutes. Yes, 15. Okay. Sounds okay. good. All right. Yeah. 
Hello, are you online? Yep, me? Yeah, maybe may, you can just quickly disconnect once and connect again. Okay. Same link. The maybe we can try see if the slides get clearer. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and then you have to share screen again, right? Sure, okay. sure. Yeah, I'll do. No. Okay. Actually, very clear now. Oh, really? Is it better? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But okay. maybe things will get worse uh, over time, <laughs> but hopefully not. Yeah, I, I apologize. My connection isn't uh, great, so I'm not shocked. Yeah, but I've also shared a link for everyone on the chat box. Uh, okay. Box link for the slide, so they can also parallelly download it. I think that's that's great because it will as we go along there will be more notation um, on screen so okay. yeah if, if they cannot see it it will be hard okay yeah this is very clear okay I think maybe when you switched off your video things went bad I don't know but uh, oh so should I switch it off for... or keep it on what do you think no no I think when it's on at this point it's very clear. I don't uh -huh. know how these correlations work. I don't know if uh, there's any causal link. So let's <laughs> keep going as is. Yeah. Uh, so let's, uh, maybe what we should do is, uh, let me know if it starts going uh, bad again, and then I can uh, turn it, turn the video off. Okay, I think we can uh, start. We'll uh, try to end it. We'll do this one hour, 20 minute thing. So, yeah. you know, around uh, just five or 10 minutes before five, we can end. Yes, yeah, 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 okay. sure. Yeah, just give me a, if you can give me a heads up. Uh, if, I usually don't get carried away. I'm good with time, but just uh, if I continue, give, let me know. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, hi everyone. Uh, so we're gonna continue with the Dawn Bush Fisher Samuelson, the DFS model. Um, so what we did was we first set up the production side um, side of things, right? So in figure two, what we have is uh, A of Z, which really plots the uh, relative labor productivity uh, across the two countries. And as I said, it's diminishing in home country advantage. Right? Um, and we saw that if I were to draw a line, which is W over W star here, a horizontal line, then, and then look at where it intersects uh, capital A, and then look at where Z1 is, the intersection. What this tells me is everything to the left of Z1, home is going to produce an export because its price is lower for those products. And anything to the right, uh, foreign will produce an export, which means home is going to import those products, right? So that's the production side. Now let's superimpose the consumption side onto this uh, diagram. So that's what we're going to do next. Um, now, to reiterate, we're going to assume that consumers are identical. Right? Identical, so, right? Identical homothetic identical. utility functions. Uh, we're going to look at it it's in the in the model, in the DFS model, these are Cobb-Douglas uh, utility functions. So that means what we can do with Cobb Douglas functions is we can define this number B of Z, right? And that is the share of income that consumers spend on good Z. Right? So how do we define B of Z? It's just 
total expenditure on consumption of Z, which is price times consumption of Z, divided by income. So it's the share of income that consumers spend on Z. Now we're going to denote the fraction of income spent on domestic goods. So everything going from zero to the Z bar, which is how much home uh, producers, right? Home producers and exports. So we're going to denote the fraction of income that is spent on the domestic goods zero to Z bar as G of Z bar is just the integral going from zero to Z bar B of DZ. And as I said, B is defined as the share of income, right? So if I integrate all the way from zero to Z bar, which is all those home goods that home is producing and exporting, I just integrate integral is just another way of saying sum, right? It's an infinite sum. If it was finite, I would be putting a summation sign, but it's infinite goods. So that's why I'm integrating all the way from zero to Z bar, all of the home produced goods. So this capital G of Z tells me the total, uh, the fraction of total income that is spent on these domestic goods that are produced at home and sold. Now, if the domestic share uh, of, of uh, expenditure is G, then the share of expenditure on foreign goods, everything the foreign country produces and sells is just going to be equal to one minus, right? So the, because this is the proportion. So one minus G of Z is the expenditure on foreign goods. So we're gonna look at the equilibrium condition now, which is that income has to be equal to expenditure in the home consumer market, right? What does that mean? What is home income? Note that there's, it's a Ricardian model, right? It's a Ricardian model, which means there's only one factor of production and that's labor, right? So the total income that the country earns is nothing but the wage times the labor force of that country. Okay? So that's your total income. What is total expenditure? So total expenditure is the total global income, global GDP times the fraction of that global GDP that is spent on domestically produced goods. Okay. So total GDP is given by home income, WL, plus foreign income, which is W star, L star. You add the two, and because there are just two countries, home and foreign, that's your global GDP. We know that by definition, G of Z is the fraction of global income that is spent on home goods on domestic goods okay so that gives us the total expenditure in the world on home produced products so in equilibrium income has to equal expenditure now algebraically i can manipulate uh, that equation and i can write w over w star is equal to g divided by one minus g times l star over l now I'm going to call this function on the right, which is just the G over one minus G times L star over L. I'll call that B. And so B is just a function and it's a function of these parameters here, Z bar and then L star and L. Okay. Now what I can do, another way of course, that you can write this equation, income equals expenditure, is to also say import value equals export value. In other words, balance of payments. That's another way to do it, but we can still stick to the income equals expenditure equation. It's the same thing. It gives us the same thing. Now, market clearing is when both the producer and consumer markets are in equilibrium, right? So that means it's the intersection of the A line and this B line that I'm going to draw uh, onto this graph, right? So the B function that I defined earlier, I'm going to draw that on this particular graph and the intersection is going to give us the equilibrium relative wages and where uh, the, the number of goods or the proportion of goods that home produces and what foreign produces. So what we have done here is we have extended the Ricardian model to a continuum of goods, infinite number of goods, and we have determined in equilibrium how many of these goods are going to be produced uh, at home and exported and how many of these goods are going to be produced in the foreign country and imported. So this is all you need to know in the DFS model. Everything is captured in this diagram right here and the intersection is going to give us Z1, the equilibrium relative wage W over W1, 
and it tells us the pattern of trade, who exports and who imports. Okay. Now, what this uh, does, as I said, DFS, the reason I like it is it's very nice to do comparative statics with this model. So what we're going to do is we are going to do one particular comparative static exercise, right? And then as a homework, I'm going to let you uh, do another one. So it's on the slides, but I won't go through it due to because of our time constraints, but you're welcome to look at it at home. And if you have any questions, we can discuss it uh, next time. Okay. So let's do the first comparative static exercise. What happens if the foreign country experiences growth, right? So think about this. Suppose you're trading. So if this is India and China. Let's see. It's just two countries in the world. India is trading with China. China is the foreign country. And suddenly China experiences population growth by 10%. So L star, which is the labor force in the foreign country, goes up by 10%. Can anyone tell me what happens on the graph? So here we have our equilibrium, the initial equilibrium point, right? So the initial equilibrium is where Z1 is the cutoff. Everything to the left of Z1 is being produced at home. Every, everything to the right of Z1 is being produced abroad in China. Okay. Now, if China experiences population growth, what happens to, um, what changes on this graph? This one responds B of uh, Z shifting to the right and another saying it's to the left. Is it to the left or to the right? There are, there are responses on both directions. Okay. Right, so it shifts to the left, up. Okay, so everyone said right for some reason. So L star has gone up. Right, so that means upwards shift from the black line to the blue line. Uh, if this shifts up, what happens? What changes in the model? So earlier it was only zero to Z1 that was being produced in India. Z1 to infinity was being produced or, or everything to the right was being produced in China. Now China has increased its, its, uh, its population, right? So L star has gone up. China is now a bigger country by 10%. What does that mean? That means a lot fewer products are going to be produced in India now. So it's only zero to Z2 that's being produced in India. Z2 to Z1 is where the change happens. So earlier India was producing these products, but now it's going to be produced by China. Okay? And everything to the right is to, of Z1 is still being produced by China. So what happened when there was population growth in China? Essentially Indian imports went up. Right, so more is now being imported by India from China because China is now a larger country. It has a larger labor force. Now, here's the question. Why um, is this a good thing for India, do you think? Should India be worried about this? So typically we would think that countries would worry about this, right? So they would say, oh, okay, India, China is a fast growing country in terms of population, it's, it's, it's large, and we're now importing more from China, so that's not a good thing for us, is, is one thing people might say. But that's where the model helps us to look at the welfare effects. So let's look at the welfare effects in the home country. Okay? So goods produced at home, zero to Z2, what happens? So we know from the equilibrium condition that P equals W times A, right? Because these goods are being produced at home, the labor market equilibrium condition has to hold. And so we know that for all goods between zero and Z2 that are being produced in India, the price has to equal the wage times A, okay? Or the inverse of productivity. In other words, P over W has to be equal to A, okay? Now, there has been no change in A because A is, if you remember the inverse of productivity, it's a technological parameter. There's no change in A. And because there's no change in A, P over W has not changed for the goods that are uh, on the continuum zero to Z2. What does that mean? P over W, if you notice, is the inverse of the, the real wage, right? W over P is the real wage. In other words, how much, what, it's it's signal of purchasing power. So what this is telling us is on zero to Z2, on that particular spectrum, nothing has changed in terms of Indian purchasing power. The real wage in India is still the same. 
Okay. But let's look at now, let's look at what happened to goods that were previously imported, Z1 to 1. Right. So if you remember, Z1 to 1 was being imported earlier and it's still being imported. What happens there? Well, because these goods are being imported, China is the cheaper producer of these goods. Right. And the Chinese price P star for these goods is W star times A star. Right. Now, if we divide through by W, what we see is P star over W is just W star over W times A star. Now, let's look at what has changed. A star has not changed. That's technology that is still uh, where we are. It's the same as before. What happened to W star over W? Let's go back to the graph, right? Because of the shift of the curve, W over W star has actually gone up in the new equilibrium. So because W star over W has gone up, sorry, W over W star has gone up, W star over W went down, and that means P star over W went down. So what does that mean? That means W over P star actually went up. In other words, the real wage for the Indian consumer or, or, or a worker in the, in the, in the, in the um, section Z1 to 1, right, has actually gone up. Okay, so and that's a good thing. So when the real wage goes up, that's a welfare improvement because purchasing power has gone up. Now let's look at what happened between goods in, in, between Z1 and Z2 because this is where the change happened. So between Z1 and Z2, previously these goods were produced in India, but because China experienced an increase in its labor force, those goods are now being produced in China and they are being Im imported by India. So because these goods are now being imported, uh, we know that the price, the P star, that the low price now is less than W times AZ, right? Because if it's being imported, it means in the Indian um, cost of making those products is actually higher than the Chinese price. That's why it's being imported. So we know that the P star is going to be less than W times A, the cost of making it in India. In other words, P star over W is actually less than A. Okay, So prior to your product, these improvements, what happened was P over W was equal to A, but now P star over W is actually less than A. Okay? So that in other words, P star over W has gone down. Again, that means that W over P star has actually gone up. So that's again an increase in the real wage in that spectrum. Okay, so what we have shown by sectioning uh, the goods in the continuum is that we have taken each continuum at a time and we have shown that either the real wage did not change for Indians or it actually went up after this population growth in China. Okay? So what we have shown is that actually India benefits because China's population went up by 10%. So what happened to China, though? And I think someone here, if I remember, it came up in the chat box, someone picked this up. What is going to happen for China is very different, right? So let's again do this uh, for three, for, for these different sections. So the goods imported, zero to Z2, right? So note that if India is exporting, that is something that China is going to be importing, right? So for China, zero to Z2 is a section where these goods are being imported. So that means it's the Indian price that rule that applies there, right? So the Indian price for those goods is P equals W times A. If I divide by the Chinese wage, because we're doing the welfare calculation for China now, that means this is P over W star. On the right, you have W over W star times A. And we know what happened to W over W star. Okay, so because that went up, what we find here is that P over W star goes up. In other words, the real wage in China has gone down. Okay, so that's a welfare decrease for Chinese consumers. Now, I'm not going to go through the same argument again and again, but what you can do is you can look at the goods that were previously imported by China, Z1 to Z2 in that particular spectrum. And what you can show is that P star over W star again rises for China. In other words, there's another, there's a, there's a welfare decrease even in that section for them. Okay. And the reason that happens is that the decline in price, 
is faced by foreign in this range is not enough to compensate for the decline in wage. So remember that the Chinese economy has seen an increase in its labor force, right? So L star went up. And so there's going to be a decline in wage. And unfortunately for them, the decline in price is not enough to compensate for that decline in wage. In other words, the real wage in China goes down in that interval, Z1 to Z2. Okay. So what we can show from the comparative statics in this exercise is when China experiences, if it experiences population growth, that's a good thing for India, but that's a bad thing for China okay, in this model. Uh, of course, what we will find is that the share of world income, the share of Chinese China in the world income is going to go up. That's because they, they are now a bigger country. They have a larger uh, population or labor force. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to encourage you to do the second comparative static exercise here. So here's a productivity shock. So a, a star drops by 10%. If a star do drops by 10%, because A star is the inverse of labor productivity, what that means is that, um, suppose if we take the same example of China, China suddenly if you're interested, is to actually do the comparative uh, static exercise in this, uh, in the, for the productivity. Right? I think it will be useful for you to get a grip on the on the model. So what you need to think about is which curve shifts and how. The good news, the answer is there. You just have to follow through, but I encourage you to go over it at home. Okay. Um, any questions on this? Any comments? Uh, Gautam, anything I need to tackle at this point? No. So uh, someone, I think, just asked, what if there is relative population growth? In this case, I think she has kept the other country's population constant, so it is a relative population growth. Yeah. Uh, so I think that question is all automatically answered. But Correct. there are no other questions. Yeah, look, always think relative, guys. It's trade. Everything is relative in trade, right? So when we are talking about L star going up, uh, it's usually we're talking about relative. So the other country's fixed L star goes up, so relatively, the, China, the population in China goes up. Yeah, you're right, Gautam. Anything else? I don't think there are any other questions at this point. Right. So here is now the big, so what we're going to do is we, I want to talk to you briefly about the limitations of this, uh, of the Ricardian model, right? One issue with the Ricardian model is that it assumes complete specialization and labor is the only factor of production. Right. And that's a problem. As we move on to the next model, which is the Hexerolene model, you will see how it gets more interesting when you have several factors of production. So one big limitation of Ricardo, labor is the only factor and you see complete specialization and that's not very realistic. So in real life, you rarely see complete specialization in any one sector. Uh, but there are some advantages of the Ricardian model. The, the main thing is technology is a big player in this model, right? And what people find is that once you include technology differences across countries, you massively increase the prediction value of a lot of um, empirical trade models. So it's very important to take into account technological differences. And what that means is the Ricardian reason to trade turns out to be quite important. So ignoring technology in trade setting is never a good idea. So that's one of the strengths of the Ricardian model in that it tackles this, uh, these technological differences. And it tells us how technological differences can predict trade patterns. And empirical studies have found that technology is a very important determinant of trade. Okay. I just have uh, uh, one question that was asked. Why? Uh... Yeah. We don't consider the increase in demand by the population growth. I think she's referring to the fact that, well, you consider uh, Chinese population to grow up, to go up, but then demand also rises. Do you know what that? And uh, there's another question. Can there be a situation where we go back to the same level of exchange or imports? I'm not well, sure. I think uh, that's, again, with respect to this uh, increase in population question. Oh, to the same level of what? Sorry, I didn't. I didn't pick that up. I think uh, the Z cutoffs. Do they? Is there any chance of going 
to the same level uh, as before the population increase yeah oh uh, going back to the same level uh, no so as this is basically a change in equilibrium so once the uh, the l increases then you are at a new equilibrium right so and then for something else to change then something else will have to change after that okay uh, and i think the previous question was so it is true that if you're a larger um, your income is going to go up so if you look at the consumer right so this is picking up the share of uh, income the share of expenditure on each product so when china becomes a bigger economy yes its income levels are going to be uh, larger it's going to um, spend more on goods right on both domestic and foreign goods so that is the extent to which we're going to pick up demand any relative differences in demand we, we don't focus on as i said in these in these types of models uh, is that uh, is that good i think so uh, so yeah i mean there's some quick comment about it's not really a question chinese government can change its policy to the mm -hmm. to compensate for the loss in welfare i think that's of course question. of yeah. course yes yes of course i'm not talking about any any counter you can counter this with policies you're right domestic policies i'm not getting into that yeah look these are pretty simplistic models so uh, they're all there to just make a point basically right uh, all right anything else before we move on to the slide, to the more updated version so let me quickly go to testing and then i'll also do a, ca a case study for for um with a couple of countries, right? So let's talk about testing this model. How would you test it? So one thing I can do directly is I can, the equilibrium condition here is really that India will export something to let's say China. I'm gonna take a two country case again, India and China. So India will export something to China if, right? W over W star is less than A star over A. Uh, and so I can write this uh, alternatively as just W times A divided by W star times A star as less than one. So as long as the relative unit labor cost, RULC, is less than one, then that's when uh, the country exports that particular product, Z, right? So what this is saying, this is actually quite powerful. It's saying that how do you measure export competitiveness of a particular country? How do you know if India is competitive in exports in a particular sector? What you do is you look at this relative unit labor cost, right? So you look at the la unit, the labor cost in India, the unit labor cost, which is W times A, and you compare that to the unit labor costs in other countries. And if the relative cost is less than one for India, then India has an, uh, comp has competitiveness okay, in that particular product. So it's a really quick way where, whereby you can compare export competitiveness patterns and trends uh, across countries. Now, what data do we need really to estimate these unit labor costs? It's quite simple. You need data on wages and you need data on output and employment. Okay. As long as you have data on these, uh, on, on A, B, and C, you can look at competitiveness across sectors. So there have been some uh, very, very early studies in 1950s trying to estimate the relationship. So trying to see if this Ricardian prediction really holds, right? Is the Ricardian model really important in explaining international trade? So the way McDougall does this in 1951-52 is just run a simple regression. So the regression here is just your uh, relative exports between the UK and the US, right? And that is regressed on labor productivity in the UK relative to labor productivity in the US. So ratio of the two. So this is, remember, the A function that we talk about, the capital A, right? Which is just the relative labor productivities. And so the hypothesis on this is beta one is greater than zero. So if the relative labor productivity goes up for the UK relative to the US, then that's going to increase exports okay, uh, of the UK relative to the US. Now, does, does anyone see what the problem is with the regression like this? Is, is there something we are missing given the previous slide? Anything here? Would, how would, so, how, are we picking everything up, whatever we need here? Labor supply. 
Okay, labor technology. supply. Someone says technology is missing. Wait, so labor productivity is technology. Remember, so technology is what drives differences in labor productivity. So when we say labor productivity, we use it interchangeably with technology. Someone says statistical oh. error term. Okay, yes, of course. I, I'm. Uh, no, I haven't put that in, but of course they had that in there, right? That's yeah. yeah. That's a given. Now, one thing is where where are wages here? So that's one thing that we have to keep in mind, right? So when we um, look at this relative unit labor costs, what we want to compare really is total labor cost. And that is a combination of productivity and wages. So that's a very, very important point that the Ricardian model makes, right? We want to talk about wages and productivity. It's not enough to look, about, look at just productivity or just look at the wage. And that may seem very obvious to us at this point, right? Because we have just looked at the Ricardian model, but you would be surprised at how many policymakers often just look at one thing or the other. So I'll give you an example. But before we do that, there have been some improvements to estimation here. So Golub has a 2004 paper where uh, they run this regression, but they also account for, so they look at relative sectoral unit labor cost as defined in the Ricardian model. So instead of just looking at the ratios of labor productivity, what they do is they also look at this RULC, the relative unit labor cost as defined in the DFS. And when they regress that or the relative unit labor cost on exports, they actually find that it's pretty um, a good fit, right? So what you do, the, you, they do this for, for different countries, US, Canada, Japan, Germany, France, Italy, uh, UK, right? So they look at the sectoral trade balance, which is net exports on these uh, unit labor costs. And they find that when the unit labor costs are high, exports are low. In other words, when you're good at making something, you tend to export more of it. That's what the Ricardian model would, would predict. Okay. Uh, they do this with an OLS, which is a simple regression, ordinarily squares. And they also use a panel data model called the fixed effects model. We will talk more about these econometric estimation techniques if we do the, the empirical in lecture three, right? But they do both these models and they find broad support for Ricardo. Unit labor costs, relative unit labor costs are an important predictor of exports. Okay? Uh, There's a quick question. So, uh, how, yeah. how is the labor productivity computed? Labor productivity is typically simply uh, Y over L. So how much output is produced uh, per unit of labor. Okay, so it's the inverse of the unit of the labor uh, unit labor cost la unit labor requirement. Sorry. Uh, is there any other question on this slide? On uh, it was Take. about uh, fixed effects, but you said that you will cover that in lecture three. Yeah. Um, so f yeah. So for now, just think that fixed effects is a better model than OLS uh, empirically. Someone asks whether the T stats or standard errors in the parenthesis. <laughs> okay, what do we think? T stats or standard errors? So the stars are statistical significance. These are T stats. Okay, so uh, in the in the parentheses, these are T stats. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, what is so? Can you please explain X in terms of trade? I think. I'm not sure. Oh, X is simply export. So usually when you say X, we refer to it oh, as yeah. exports okay. are X. Okay, so we're looking at exports and how so the Ricardian model tells us about export competitiveness, right? Who would export what? And what it tells us is in order to know who exports what, all you need to look at is the relative uh, unit labor costs. And what are the rel what is what drives the relative unit labor cost? It's your relative productivity and it is your relative wages, right? A combination of your relative productivity and relative wages drives your production cost, relative production cost. And that's what drives exports, export competitiveness. All right, so let me go to some, uh, some examples here. So here is one example, what happens when foreign productivity goes up? Right, so here, this is uh, data on relative productivity levels in Japan and the US between 1950 and 1990. So this is Japanese productivity relative to US productivity. And the US is normalized to 100. So all of these numbers are telling you what is the relative productivity of Japan compared to the US uh, at 100. So anything less than 100 means Japan is less productive. 
Anything more than 100 means Japan is more productive. So what do you observe uh, given these numbers? What you can see here is a huge takeoff of Japanese productivity in machinery and equipment. And note that automobiles, et cetera, comes under machinery and equipment, right? So somewhere starting in the 1970s, between the 1970s and 1990, the Japanese relative productivity vis-a-vis -vis the US simply shot up. Okay? So Japan became way more productive. Now, what would the Ricardian model say? So the Ricardian model would say that, uh, look, if Japan's relative productivity is shooting up between 1970 and 1990, that means Jap Japan is becoming more competitive relative to the US and it will export uh, machinery and equipment to the US. Am I correct in saying that? Am I missing anything? Can I say that? Can I just say, oh, looking at this table here, Japan is going to start exporting machinery and equipment to the USA. Is there anything I'm missing? People think yes. People think yes. Guys, what about wages? Should I look at what happened to wages? Yes, very good. So now people have picked up. So what we what I want to emphasize here is always look at a combination, right? So unit labor cost, that's a combination of productivity and wages. And that will maybe clear to you on the next slide. So let's look at this. This is labor productivity, wages, and unit labor costs in developing countries relative to the United States. Okay. Now, these are very old numbers, so don't really take it seriously because this is taken from... Golub's 1995 study, uh, but I just want to make a point. So here you have the United States normalized at one. So productivity, wages, unit labor cost. What's unit labor cost? It's a combination of wages and productivity, right? How productive you are and how cheaply you can use labor, right? In other words, how what is labor cost in your country? The reason I'm putting this graph in front of you is if I were to just look at productivity. So let me just focus on the blue bars, right? What would the U.S. think? Well, the U.S. would think, oh, wow, um, Korea, say India, Philippines, Malaysia have very, very low productivity. I have very high productivity. Similarly, if you look at just wages, um, and this happened in the U.S., right? There was a lot of anxiety in the U.S. because the U.S. was trading over time in the 90s more and more with countries that have very low wages, right? Think Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, India, so countries to the right. Very low wages, which is given by this gray bar. Now, does did the U.S. have to worry so much about trading with countries like India, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand because their wages were so low? The Ricardian model would say, not really, because look at productivity. Productivity, yes, wages were low in these countries, but relative productivities were also very, very low compared to the U.S., which means that if you look at unit labor cost, which is a combination of wages and productivity, then what do you see? Is the US, does the U.S. really have to worry? I mean, are these countries that much more competitive in terms of exports relative to the U.S.? No, because if you look at Malaysia, Philippines, India, you're actually seeing that the unit labor cost is more than one. In other words, they have a comparative disadvantage relative to the U.S. And why is that? Because even though their wages are low, their productivity is so low that the unit labor costs are actually high. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make, is there's no point. What the Ricardian model tells us is when there are these technological differences, if you want to know which country is competitive to export, what you need to look at is not just labor productivity, but also wages. So it's a combination. It's about unit labor costs, the cost of producing. Okay, okay so let's look at India's case. What we know from data is uh, that regular and daily uh, casual wage rates for India in between 2004 and uh, 11 the growth in the wage was about 20%. So Indian casual daily wage growth was actually high, 20% uh, at this time. Now, what does that mean about India's export competitiveness? So would it be right to say that, oh, because India is experiencing wage growth, that means it's losing competitiveness. Indian labor is becoming more expensive. We're losing export competitiveness. Is it right? Is, can I say that? Not really, because I'm then I wouldn't be looking at productivity. Right? So if you on the link here, it gives you the um, relative productivities uh, 
across various Indian sectors in the CLEMS database. So I downloaded this from the RBI website. Okay, so if you click on that, and you should have that link um, on the slides, what it gives you is labor productivity across these different sectors. And it will show you that, I, um, let me do that here. So you wanna be looking at these productivity levels. So let me go to TFP. Okay, so TFP based on value added, right? So if I look in that time period, 2004, 2005 to about 2011, what I want to look at are if, and this is annual growth in, in TFP, right? So if I can find sectors where cumulatively the growth in TFP was more than 20%, then actually in those sectors, even though the wage rate was going up in India overall, uh, India was actually relatively, had the potential to be building export competitiveness in, in those sectors. Okay, so the po simple point I'm trying to make is don't just look at wage growth, look at wage growth in combination with labor productivity. That will give you a sense of changes in um, relative labor costs. And according to the Ricardian model, that is what we wanna look at when we um, talk about export competitiveness. Okay, okay. Uh, any questions on this? Are we good so far with the Ricardian model? I think so. I don't think there are any questions at this point. Maybe people are typing them up, uh, so maybe they'll take a while, but I think we can continue and if there are questions, we can come back. Yes, sure. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, now I'm going to go to the Eaton Kortum model. And now this model is, uh, I'm taking you, as I said, I started with Ricardo and I'm bringing you up to roughly about 2006. So this is the next big model in the in the Ricardian um, setting. Okay? And it's a very useful model because it also gives you, one, the foundation for the gravity model. And the second thing is it um, allows us to talk about gains from trade. So it's a good model for that. Fisher Samuelson model. So U belongs to the interval zero one. Continue. We are also going to expand our countries now. So this is not just India and China. So this is India against uh, combined with every other country in the world, right? So N a finite number of countries. We have preferences that are CES. Uh, now I'm sure most of you are familiar with what the constant elasticity of substitution preferences. And in international trade models, uh, usual, this is the most um, common type of preference that you will come across, CES, constant elasticity of substitution. So what this says is uh, con consumers get utility from consuming this entire continuum of products. Okay? And there is a substitution parameter, sigma, that uh, controls how they substitute one um, a product for the other. Okay, so consumers are going to consume all products and they're going to get utility from all and sigma is the substitution parameter that uh, controls substitution elasticity. Now, we have one factor of production, which is labor, the wage. Oh, so I got a question here about uh, why are we looking at models and not empirics? Okay, so that is... Uh, if you remember at the starting of the course, I did say, I, I think that it is a good idea for us to first look at the theory. So that's the whole point is to look at the models, see what they have to say, and then we are going to look at what data has to say. Okay? But if we just look at data without looking at theory, then we might be misguided. So there's a danger to that. Okay? So that's the reason we're focusing uh, on these models. And again, I, I'll show you that we're gonna be able to calculate things with the eaton Kortum model. Okay, so the eaton Gordon model is the foundation for gravity, and we are going to be able to look at things like gains from trade. But you're, you're going to have to hang on. I apologize for the pain. It is a painful model, but I promise you that it's worth it. Okay. Uh, so one factor of production, wage, we have a productivity distribution that we're going to look at. So productivity is given by the letter Z. Uh, now, we are changing notation here, so be careful. Earlier, we kept saying that A was unit labor requirement and 1 over A was productivity. Okay. Now, we're going to change notation and we're going to say Z 
is productivity. U is going to index the good. So let's not get confused. Earlier it was A and Z for productivity and goods. Now it's Z and U for productivity and goods. So what we're going to assume is that productivity has a distribution. Okay? So it follows a Frechet uh, distribution. Now from now on, what we're going to do is we're going to disregard U. So we're going to do this for one good. And then right at the very end, I'm going to say, okay, let's now consider all the possible goods and then just integrate over everything. Okay? So for now, we're going to disregard U. What is a Frechet distribution? Uh, I hope you are all familiar with CDFs, right? Does everyone know what a CDF is? It's the cumulative distribution function. Okay? And what it tells us is the probability that productivity is less than or equal to a particular constant, let's say Z, or particular number Z. Okay? Now, the notation for that for Frechet is F of subscript I of Z. Now, when I say I, I usually mean a particular country. And so you can think of I as indexing country. And so the productivity is, you can think of this as the productivity of that particular country, right? So the probability that productivity of country I is less than or equal to the number Z is given by the CDF of the uh, Frechet distribution. Now, you might ask me, why are you considering a Frechet distribution? And that's not me. It's Eaton and Kortum who um, use the Frechet distribution. And the reason that they use the Frechet distribution is going to become apparent soon because it has some very nice mathematical properties. So when you integrate, things cancel out really well and everything looks very tractable and good. right? So that is why they use this um, Frechet distribution. So we're going to see how that works. Just related to that, there's a question on why you use CES as opposed to a variable elasticity of substitution uh, functional forms. That is a good question. Um, look, I think it's really one of the reasons is just to keep it tractable. Okay, so most of these models are going to be using uh, CES. Uh, but it, it's a good question. I have to think more about that. I don't think I have seen any major models that use uh, variable uh, that don't use CES really. Actually, uh, also I agree that the, the, in the more complicated uh, and more sort of papers which uh, use uh, calibration and that sort of uh, techniques, they mm -hmm. find that these elasticities are very important. And uh, they sort of prefer to have it uh, have a single variable uh, parameter calibrated to match the elasticities in the data and just vary uh -huh. them and see what happens to the important implications. Uh, I see. I think if you if you have a variable elasticity of substitution preferences, you can't do that sort of exercises. Yeah. So it may be more tractable for calibration purposes as well. That That is true. But I must say, it's a good question. I mean, I have uh, never seen anyone do a variable elasticity, at least not in any of the major models. But, but it's a good question. I think it is a limit. It is a, it's an yeah. assumption. Yeah. Another is, uh, can we look at uh, the Frechet distribution graphs, CDF? Ah, actually, I don't have that here. That's a good question. I don't have it, unfortunately, here, but I'm sure we can Google for it. Uh, I think that's, um, yeah, unfortunately, it's not here. Okay. Uh, I don't know that it is really relevant in, in any case. Yeah, I think for now, uh, I think what you need yeah. to know is just that the key is uh, absolute. Yeah, advantage. okay. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so let me get to that. Thanks, Gautam. Thanks for reminding me. So let's, yeah, let's talk about what these things mean. So T is typically taken as a absolute advantage parameter. Okay. So T means, um, just think of the, how good a country is. So the US would have high absolute advantage. It's good at making everything. So that would be captured in TI. Similarly, let's say any economic development, technological progress, etc., would be reflected by changes in T. Right? Now, theta is what controls the shape of that uh, distribution, of the Frechet distribution. So to get at that 
point, theta uh, is a shape parameter that controls the, the shape. Okay. Okay. So, and got them jump in anytime, uh, whenever, if you want to clarify something, feel free. Uh, so, trade is subject to iceberg transport cost. Um, I don't know if, if, if people know what iceberg transport cost is. So, what this means is if you think about an iceberg, right? And if you think about an iceberg being transported, what you will note is that uh, a sum of the iceberg melts while it is on the way, right? So, if you're taking an iceberg from India to China, some of it is going to melt, which means that if you want uh, the product to get to China in one piece, you have to ship more than what is intended uh, to get there, right? Because some of it is going, you're going to lose it on the way. So there's going to be some depreciation on the way. And that's what the iceberg transport cost uh, picks up. So DNI is greater than or equal to one means that you have to ship a lot more than one if you want one unit of that product to get to the destination. So it's a way of modeling these um, transport costs. Now, all markets are going to be perfectly competitive. Uh, and so what we get is that the unit cost of delivering a, a commodity from I to N, which is given by PNI of Z. So P is just another, it's a notation for price, right? So think of this as the price of obtaining something in India. So suppose that N is India. Uh, I is going to be any other country. So let's say I is China, N is India. So the price of getting a commodity delivered from China to India is going to be given by this particular expression. CI times DNI divided by ZI. So in other words, CI drives the cost, the marginal cost of making that commodity in China. Remember, I is China here, right? So CI tells you how expensive it is to make that commodity in China. DNI tells you how expensive it is to ship that commodity from China to India. And divided by ZI says this is normalized by productivity level. So higher is Z means higher the productivity level in China. And lower is the unit cost of obtaining uh, that product in India. So high productivity countries are going to be able to deliver a product to you at a cheaper um, price. Okay? So that's the whole Ricardian concept of productivity and technological differences. Now, if labor is the only factor, which we, in Ricardo, in the Ricardian models, labor is the only factor of production. So one simplification that people usually make is they say C is equal to W. In other words, the cost of making something is simply the wage in that country, okay? the marginal cost. So let's look at the CDF of prices. What is the cumulative distribution function of prices in this setting? We're going to denote that by the G N I of P. Again, remember that N is India, which is the home country. And let's say I is any other country, China. P is the price. And that's simply given by the, uh, by de the definition of prices here, right? So the probability, the CDF of P denoted by G N I of P is just the probability that P N I is less than or equal to P. And if you look at this expression here and say, see when this expression is less than or equal to P, that happens when ZI is greater than or equal to CI DNI divided by P. Okay. And what is probability that ZI is greater than this constant here? Given the Frechet distribution, that's just one minus FI of CI DNI divided by P, where FI is the Frechet um, distribution function. Any questions on any of the notation? Uh, is the notation clear to everyone? I think so. I don't think there are any questions. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to establish uh, one or two facts coming out of this. And then we're going to derive two things. So we're going to derive the probability that India imports from China. And we're going to denote that by pi and i. And then the other thing we're going to derive is just what prices are going to look like in India. Okay, given that India is sourcing these different products from these different countries. Okay. okay, so let's look at what prices are going to look like in India. N is India. Now, in the EK model, 
what India is going to do is it is going to look for the least cost supplier of that product. So suppose we're talking about cars here. So what is the price of cars in India? Well, that's going to depend upon who can supply to us at the minimum. Okay, so different countries can supply us cars at different prices depending on their productivity levels and the cost of shipping those cars from, the, from those countries to India. And we're going to pick the minimum of PN1, PN2, dot, 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 PNN. So we're going to look at the prices of all these different countries and we'll pick the minimum. Now that's going to give us the distribution of prices in India, which we're going to define as GN of P. So this is the distribution of prices. And what is the definition of that? It's just the probability that the price in India is less than or equal to constant P. So we're just defining the CDF of prices. What is that? So the probability that the price in India is less than or equal to P is the probability, it's one minus probability that everyone ships it to us at greater than or equal to P because we're picking the least cost supplier here, right? We're picking the one that can deliver it to us at the minimum. So the probability that PN is less than or equal to P is equal to the probability is, is equal to one minus the probability that everyone is only giving it to us at a price higher than P. And what is the probability that everyone's prices are greater than or equal to P? Well, that's the product across all the different countries that all of their prices are greater than or equal to P. Okay? And we can calculate what this is because this is nothing but the probability that each country's price is greater than or equal to the constant P, which as we have defined before is simply one minus GNI of P from the previous slide. Okay? Uh, from the previous slide, we also wrote what this GNI of P is. It's just one minus the Frechet uh, cumulative distribution function, Fi. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just substitute. So I'm going to say one minus the product over I of one minus GNI of P. That's this right here, this expression. That's equal to one minus the product, right? So what is one minus GNI? That's, I just put a one minus there. So that's just Fi. So I'm going to write down Fi here, and I can then substitute in for the Frechet distribution. We know that that's what the Frechet distribution looks like. And so what this tells me is that the GN, which is the distribution of prices, looks like this. Okay? And I'm going to simplify. So this is simply product of the exponent of these, right, these terms. And we know that the exponent, if you take the product of the exponents, all you need to do is sum all of those exponents. So we're going to call the sum of i going from 1 through n, ti, ci, di to the power negative theta, just phi of n. And so this expression just reduces to 1 minus e to the power negative phi n, p to the power theta. Now, I know this is a little overwhelming, but I want to spend some time on this phi n. Okay, so what is the meaning of phi n here? So if you look at phi n, it's nothing but a sum of ti, ci, dni to the power negative theta, right? So in a sense, it is the average cost. So you're summing across all the different countries. So it's getting at the overall uh, cost that other countries have to incur to supply the cars to, to India. You can think of it as intuitively as a sort of uh, uh, overall cost of, of obtaining this product from abroad, right? It's an average across all these uh, varieties coming from the different countries. Okay? I'll talk a lot more about this VN as we go along, especially if we do gravity, then uh, we will be talking a lot more about this. Okay, so that brings me to the first uh, thing that we're going to calculate, which is the probability that a country N buys from I. So what is the probability that India buys cars from China, where China is I? Well, how do we calculate that probability? What's the probability to buy from China? Well, that's the probability that China is the least cost supplier of cars for me. In other words, any other country, Germany, UK, all of them supply cars at a higher 
price than China. That's the only reason I would buy from China, right? So I need to calculate the probability that the price of cars for me as an Indian from China is less than or equal to the minimum of the price of cars from any other country other than China, Germany, US, and so on. Okay, so suppose that P and I is a constant. So the price of cars in India is equal to P, then for each P, right, for each potential price, the probability that China is the least cost supplier to me is equal to the probability that everyone other than China is going to supply it to me at higher price. So for any country other than China, S not equal to I, the price of cars to me is always greater than or equal to P. So that's just another way of saying China is the least cost supplier. Okay. So, or the probability, the product of the probabilities for S not equal to I, right? Greater than or P and S is greater than or equal to P. So all I'm saying is how do I calculate the probability that I import cars from China? For that, I have to calculate the probability that everyone other than China is selling at a price higher than or equal to P. So let's go one at a time. What is the probability that any random country uh, sells at a price that's greater than or equal to P? That's nothing but one minus the G and S of P, right? And we already know the um, formula for one minus G and S of P. Okay? We calculated the G and I and what it looks like. And that's just E to the power negative phi N, P to the power theta, but there's a negative I here. And what that means is I'm not taking all of the fians because I'm looking at every other country other than China. So I'm looking at all the i's not equal to s and I'm calculating the probability that all of them are actually selling to me at a higher price than p, right? So that's why we have a negative i here, which means in this particular summation, it's exactly like the earlier fian that we saw, except that it's a negative i which means it doesn't include China, it's talking about all of the other countries. Okay, so let me say this again in English. The probability that India buys from China is the probability that everybody else is supplying, other than China, of course, is supplying to India at a price higher than P, which is the price from China. Okay. Now I'm gonna integrate that over P because note that I did this for one P, right? So. For each P, I can calculate this probability. To get the overall, I have to integrate over the density um, of P, of prices, right? So that's D of G and I. So that's what I do on this next slide. What we do is we go from zero to infinity. So over the entire support uh, of prices, we then take this expression from the previous slide, okay? multiply times by P times the density of D, G, and I, and that's where this comes from. So this entire expression in the second half is just the derivative of the G and I function with respect to P times DP. This is because I'm integrating over support of P. Now, once I do this, I know that this is an extremely long expression, but look at how nicely it simplifies. So this is the beauty of the, the Frechet type distribution. Okay. So what I can do here is I can simply take everything out as long as there's no P in it. So I'm going to take all of these terms out so that there's no P in them. I'm going to keep everything with a P inside here. And once I do that, what I notice is this expression inside the integral is simply D G N of P. And if you remember, G N of P is simply the cumulative distribution of prices in India. And what is integral of D of G of DP? Note that D of G is just the density function, right, of, of this. So what happens when you integrate over the, the density function? You're going to get one, right? So this expression, the entire thing inside the integral, right, that boils down to one. And so ultimately, you're just left with this term inside the bracket. Okay. So what we have shown with this algebraic derivation is that the probability that India buys from China is given simply by this expression right here in the eaton quarter model. And this is actually quite a simple expression, right? So what are we saying? What are the factors that drive the probability that India buys cars from China? First, how good is China in making things, right? In other words, absolute advantage of China, TI. 
So if China has good technology, it's good at making things, then India is more likely to buy from China. Okay. Second, CI, DNI raised to the power of negative theta. Now, the minute something is raised to negative theta, you can think of it as though it's in the denominator, right? Because I can write this as CI, DNI in the denominator raised to the power of theta. It's easier to think of it that way. So what happens if CI goes up? In other words, wages in China go up or the cost of production, marginal costs go up in China. What happens to uh, the probability that India buys cars from China? Well, because if this is in the denominator, right? If CI goes up, then that probability is going to go down. Similarly, if the distance NI goes up, or in other words, the transport cost between China and India goes up, that's going to make it less likely that I purchase from China. Okay? And then finally, this is extremely important, phi N. What is phi N? Phi N is, as an Indian, what is the sort of overall or average cost of obtaining cars for me from not just China, but from the rest of the world. Okay. So what we're saying here is that the probability that I buy from China is not just dependent on what is going on in India and what is going on in China. It actually depends on what is going on in the rest of the world. Because note that the phi N has got all of these T's, C's, and D's for the rest of the world, all of them hiding inside the, the phi N. Okay. So this is a very, very powerful statement. Those of you who know gravity models will recognize that there is a name for this. Does anyone know the gravity model? Does anyone know what that phi n is? So if you think about this, this is very much like a gravity model of trade, right? Because it's telling us that trade between two countries is driven by transport costs of shipping, right? And it is also driven by the technology. Uh, in, in, the, in these two partner countries, right? So distance is one thing that comes into the gravity model. But one thing here, the phi n in a gravity setting is called multilateral resistance. Okay? So it's a multilateral resistance term. So what it tells us is when you're talking about trade between India and China, you can't just talk about India and you can't just talk about China. You have to talk about what is going on with every other country in the world because these costs are relative. So if the U.S. suddenly becomes more productive at making cars, right, then is that not going to change the probability that I buy from China? Yes, it is, because it's going to change the cost of getting cars from the U.S., and that can change the likelihood that I buy from China. So this is actually a very, very powerful message that comes out of the Eaton Quarter model. And to get back to one of the questions earlier about why do we not simply go to the empirical estimation, this is one of the reasons, right? So theory can often tell you uh, about things that you need to take into account when you are empirically estimating trade flow. So if we didn't have this model, we would never have thought that trade between two countries only would, would also depend on what was going on in other third countries, for instance. In fact, for a very long time, people were estimating gravity models just using distance and GDPs of two countries. Okay, so that was one thing. The second thing we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna get to this, is this gains from trade. But before we do that, we have to go through some manipulation here. Don't, don't be afraid. You can always go back later and, and go through these, um, these steps on your own. But what I'm gonna do here is derive the prices in India. Okay, so what is the price index of cars in India? Now, before we do that, remember that I have been doing all of this as though there was only one good or one product, right? Because I told you earlier, ignore the U. I said, we're going to bring back the U at a later point, And that's what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to say, we can do this for each product, U. Now, integrating over the entire continuum of goods that we have, right? So zero to one. And the price index, the average price index in India across all of the different goods adjusted for um, the elasticity of substitution parameter here. So this is the weights. I'm weighting by uh, this one minus sigma. To derive the, um, the price index, I'm going to look at what happens to PN. So first, let's raise both sides by to, I mean, let's um, ex uh, take the exponent here. So I'm going to look at PN to the power one minus sigma. Pn to the power one minus sigma is simply this expression right here on the right-hand side. Okay. Uh, now, 
what is once I look at zero to one for each U, I know that I have to look at the entire support of prices for each U, right? Because prices can go from zero to, to infinity. So that is why I'm going to take it over the entire um, support of prices P. So going from zero to infinity, P to the power one minus sigma dGn, because I know that that is the density function of prices, which we derived before for India as Gn. That equals zero to infinity P to the power one uh, minus sigma. I know what D of Gn of P is. It's just the derivative of the G distribution function. Once I take the derivative of G, that's what I get. Okay, that complicated expression right there times dP. So now we're going to see where the Frechet distribution comes in handy. So what we're going to do is do a change in variables. Okay, so what is a change in variable? I'm going to define a variable x as simply Pn p to the power theta. Okay? So once I define x like that, then I know that dx is just Pn theta p to the power theta minus 1. So I'm simply differentiating. Okay? So then what I can say is p to the power 1 minus sigma from the way I have defined x, I can say that p to the power 1 minus sigma is just x over phi n to the power 1 minus sigma divided by theta. So that comes from how I have defined x. Now I am ready to write p n to the power 1 minus sigma as equal to 0 to infinity integral. Okay. Let me substitute x. So phi n p to the power theta. Where's, yeah. So phi n p to the power theta simply becomes x over phi n to the power 1 minus sigma over theta, and then e to the negative x dx. So all I'm doing is I'm substituting for x in this expression right here. Okay. Now, anything that doesn't have an x, I can bring outside of the integral. So that's what I'm doing in that second to last uh, step right there. And then I say 0 to infinity, whatever remains inside with the x. And it turns out that that expression within the integral, the zero to infinity and that expression dx, that is called as a gamma function in mathematics. So it's a function called a gamma function. And it's simply, uh, one can write that as one minus sigma over theta plus one. All we're saying is it's a mathematical function, which is a function of exogenous parameters, sigma and theta. So sigma is your substitution, drives the substitution elasticity, and theta is the shape parameter of that uh, Frechet distribution. Okay. So what did I gain by doing all of this? Okay. Why did I uh, look at the prices at PN? Because I'm trying to get at gains from trade, right? And how do countries gain from, gain from trade? They gain from trade because prices are going to change, right? So the changes in relative prices is how we see the impacts of trade. So let's talk about gains from trade. So what we have shown is Pn is simply a gamma function. I'm not going to worry about what this gamma function is because it's simply a function parameters, exogenous parameters. Okay? And then phi n times negative 1 over sigma. Okay? So let me look at the total spending of by n on i is good. So if we took, if, let's say we take India. We look at how much India spends on Chinese goods, and we're going to call that XNI. Okay. And empirically speaking, a good way to calculate the probability that India buys from China is to simply look at the fraction of trade between India and China. So XNI divided by XN. What percentage of total Indian spending on goods is spending on Chinese goods? So the fraction of Indian spending on China, that's a proxy, an empirical way of getting at this probability of pi nine, probability of buying from China. Okay? So if you can see what I'm trying to do here is taking the model to the data in a sense, right? Now I'm going to define pi n n. Pi n n is weird because what it is, is it's the probability that India buys from India. Now you, now, you might say that doesn't make sense in a trade setting, but essentially what we're trying to get at is domestic spending. So what percentage of total Indian spending is spending on Indian goods, right? So the fraction of domestic spending. Now, from the model, we know what this is. We have calculated the probability that India buys from India. That's just Tn, Wn to the negative theta divided by Vn, right, from the previous slides. 
we know that Pn is just the gamma function, Fn to the power negative one over theta. We also know that welfare is typically measured um, as the real wage, right? The wage in India divided by prices, which is purchasing power in a way. Uh, and we know that Wn over Pn from this pi and n expression can be written and then given that Pn also is defined in terms of gamma and fees, I can actually calculate what Wn over Pn is from those two previous equations. And what I see is that it's just gamma inverse Tn to the power one over theta, pi n n negative one over theta. Okay. Now I'm gonna look at what happens to the real wage under autarky. So when there's no trade and it's an autarky situation, what happens to omega n or the real wage in India? Well, in that case, pi n n is just going to be one, right? Because when you're in an autarky situation, the entire spending in India is on its domestic goods because there is no international trade. So your INN is just going to be equal to one. So that drops out. And what I'm left with is just gamma inverse TN one over theta. Okay? So how can I calculate gains from trade? So I'm going to calculate gains from trade as the purchasing power under trade relative to the purchasing power under an autarky situation. Okay, so that's just omega n divided by omega n under autarky. If I just divide those two, I'm simply left with pi n n to the power negative one over theta. So this is actually extremely powerful. I'm going to just assume that theta equals five. Uh, if you ask me why I'm doing that, it's, it's what studies typically um, do for structural uh, calibration for an estimation, right? So I'm going to assume theta is five. How do we calculate gains from trade, right? What we need to do is look at the share of India's production consumed by Indians. In other words, the domestic share of consumption. Now, if you take a country like Belgium, then Belgium consumes 0.2, right? So that's the proportion of Belgian goods that Belgians consume, essentially. So in that case, the gains from trade are going to be simply calculated as pi n n to the power negative one over theta, substitute theta equals five. And what that gives me is 0.2 to the power negative one over five. If you calculate that, it's 38%. So 38% is gains from trade for Belgium. And all I needed to calculate that is a guess at theta. And I wanted to, I had to know how much, what a uh, proportion of spending of, of Belgian total consumption spending is on Belgian products, right? Now, as homework, can you calculate gains from trade for India? Okay, so I want you to calculate gains from trade for India. What do you need to know in order to do this? All you need to know, you can guess that you can keep theta as five. All you need to know is what is India's spending um, on its own products as a proportion of total spending? Now, next time, I think this will be a good place to stop. So next time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, so we'll start with a quick recap of this on the slide. And what I'll ask you is what types of countries gain most from trade? Do you think a country like Belgium that, that where the, where it's spending on its own products is only 0 0.2 is, is Belgium going to gain more or is a country like the United States going to gain more? Because remember that the United States actually spends a lot more of its consumption spending on its own products rather than on foreign products. So domestic uh, spending for the U.S. is actually much higher than for a country like Belgium, which is a very small open economy, right? So countries like Belgium, uh, New Zealand, for instance, all of these countries spend very little on their own products. They spend a lot more on foreign products, whereas the U.S. is the opposite. So my question to you is, do countries like the U.S. gain more or do countries like Belgium gain more from trade? And then what I want you to think about is where India falls in that spectrum. Is it more like Belgium or is it more like the U.S.? Okay. So next time uh, we are going to do a quick recap of, of the Ricardian setting. And then I'm going to jump straight into Hextrolene. And hexaprolene is really where the excitement is because it starts talking about who gains and who loses. So the tension and the backlash uh, from trade is all coming from uh, some people gaining and some people losing, right? And that's where all these clashes are coming from. So Hextrolene is going to be able to um, tell us how to think about distribution, inequality, backlash to globalization, and things like that. So that's what we're going to start with tomorrow. So thank you, everyone. I hope it was uh, it was okay and it met um, your expectations. So thanks and hope to see everyone. Well, not see, I cannot see you, but uh, hope that you're all here tomorrow. Thank you.
Thanks, Sasha. I think, uh, yeah, we had one hope everybody learned as well. So tomorrow again, we'll start uh, at the same time, 2 p.m. Um, yes. And we will, yeah, we have to share the poll. Somebody reminded that. That's good. Um, yes, so we are going to have a poll. So please, everyone, uh, put in your requests. Yeah. So if the we have to figure that part out, maybe we'll do that at the beginning of tomorrow's lecture. Maybe we'll give everyone maybe five minutes and then uh, do the poll. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I'm happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let, then okay. let's do that. We'll try to figure that out today itself. Yes. Uh, and I'll share the slides for tomorrow's lectures like I did with today. Uh, the Dropbox link, I'll share that again at the beginning of tomorrow's lecture. Yes, that okay. sounds good. So that, uh, you know, the link is right there and everybody is that right away. Okay. okay. Cool. Okay. Right. Thank See you. you Thanks. Tomorrow. Yep. See everyone. Bye.